Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. In this session, let's discuss and analyze UPSC CSE Prelims 2021 GS Paper 1. We will be analyzing all the 100 questions beginning with polity followed by economics followed by the other subjects. That's number one. Number two, all the teachers would share their thoughts, their views on the nature of the question paper, the difficulty level of the question paper. That's number two. And number three, the million dollar question. What is going to be the cutoff? Last year, if you would recall, we were in a position to accurately predict the cutoff. But how was that possible? We sought details from you. We asked all the aspirants to fill in a form. Mention your expected cutoff. Mention your expected score. And we got close to one lakh entries based on which we were in a position to determine and predict the cutoff. And we are going to do the same thing this year as well. The link is provided in the video description. Fill in that form. Mention not what you think is going to be the expected cutoff, but mention what is your expected score. And we will scrutinize, we will analyze all the responses. And in a day or two, we will be in a position to come up with our expected cutoff. But if we analyze the question paper, discussing with other faculties as well, the cutoff is going to be slightly higher than the last year. Also considering the fact that the number of vacancies are lesser than the last year. So if you're scoring 100 plus, you're safe, you're going to write mains examination. If you're scoring less than that, even then, keep preparing. Because if this is your dream, you should not stop now. So let's get started. And first up, let's understand all the questions that were asked from Indian polity. Polity questions were either conceptual, fewer factual, very few current affairs based polity questions. Let's try and understand all of these questions, 18 questions from Indian polity, one by one. First up, under the Indian constitution, concentration of wealth violates what? If you look at directive principles of state policy, and if you have been attending the tablet lectures or the IS live classroom, I've always said that the relationship between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy is a very important topic. And therein I specifically tell my students that you will have to remember articles 39b and article 39c. Article 39b basically says that material resources shall be so distributed, evenly distributed, so as to subserve the common good. And 39c talks about the operation of economic system should not result in the concentration of wealth in fewer hands to a common detriment. So concentration of wealth, if it happens, it violates B, which is the directive principles of state policy. Straightforward factual question, and I'm sure everyone would be correct here. Let's look at question number two. What is the position of the right to property in India? Right to property initially was a fundamental right, mentioned under Article 19, also under Article 31 of the Constitution. The year was 1978, 44th Constitutional Amendment Act, and right to property was deleted from the list of fundamental rights. It was made other constitutional right, coming under Article 300, capital A. So right to property is a constitutional right, and constitution is the supreme law of land, which means it is a legal document. That means right to property also is a legal right. So legal right but it is available to everyone. So legal right available to any person. That is B is the correct answer. Let's look at question number three. What was the exact constitutional status of India on 26 January 1950? And we have to understand what is the preamble of the Indian constitution talking about. Sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic, republic. But socialist and secular, these were the terms which were added to the preamble by 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976. So these were not originally part of the Constitution. Originally, what was part of the Constitution? Sovereign Democratic Republic, because socialist and secular were added in the year 1976. So B is the right answer. Clear, direct, factual question. 
Let's look at question number four, which is basically a repetition. This question has been asked in a different way by the UPSC over a period of time. Constitutional government, basically there comes across a doctrine called the doctrine of limited government, which means the powers available with the government are not unlimited. There is a limitation imposed on the powers of the government, on the state. And these limitations are imposed by the constitution. So then what is a constitutional government? A constitutional government is a government limited by the terms of the constitution. D is the right answer. Let's look at another question. Consider the following statements in respect of Bharat Ratna and Padma Awards. Number one, Bharat Ratna and Padma Awards are titles under Article 18, Clause 1 of the Constitution of India. What is Article 18? Abolition of titles. All titles except academic and military titles are abolished. So if titles are abolished under Article 18, but Padma Awards, Bharat Ratna continue which basically means that these awards are not titles within the meaning of Article 18. So statement one is incorrect. Padma awards which were institu instituted in the year 1954 were suspended only once. They were suspended twice. Initially when the Janata Party came to power in the year 1977, then from 1977 to 1980, these Padma awards were suspended. Then Srimati Indira Gandhi came back to power and she restarted awarding these Padma Awards. And then again, when there was a public interest litigation pending in the court, Balaji Raghwan versus Union of India, this petition determined that Padma Awards, Bharat Ratna, they are not violative of Article 18, they are not titles, they are awards. If you are awarding somebody, that doesn't mean merit should not be recognized. And we have discussed this judgment many a times in our classes. So this Padma Award, and Bharat Ratna, they were suspended not once but twice. So even statement two is incorrect. The number of Bharat Ratna awards is restricted to a maximum of five in a particular year. And again, if you are a tablet learning program student or a live classes student, we have covered this that Bharat Ratna maximum three can be awarded in a particular year. So all these statements are incorrect. But the question is asking which of the above statements are not correct? All these statements are incorrect. D, 1, 2, 3 is the right answer. With reference to India, consider the following statements. Judicial custody means an accused is in the custody of the concerned magistrate and such an accused is locked up in the police station and not jail. The statement is wrong. Judicial custody means that an accused is lodged in a jail, not in a police station. During judicial custody, the police officer in charge of the case is not allowed to interrogate the suspect without the approval of the court. This statement is correct because if you are in the jail and the interrogator has to seek details from you, the interrogator has to seek the permission of the court. So statement two is correct. Which of the given statements is or are correct? B, two only is the right answer. With reference to India, consider the following statements. When a prisoner makes out a sufficient case, Parole cannot be denied to such prisoner because it becomes a matter of her right. Parole is at the discretion of the authorities. Furlough becomes the matter of a right of a prisoner. So statement one is incorrect. State governments have their own prisoners release on parole rules. Why? Prison is a state subject. In the distribution of powers under Schedule 7 of the Constitution, prison as a subject comes under state list. So different states have different parole rules. So statement 2 is correct. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? So B2 only is the right answer. Factual. At the national level, which ministry is the nodal agency to ensure effective implementation of the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers? which is Recognition of Forest Rights Act of 2006. Straightforward question, factual. The answer is D, Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Let's look at another question. A legislation which confers on the executive or administrative authority an unguided, uncontrolled discretionary power in the matter of application of laws violates which of the following articles of the Constitution? Simple. Article 28 deals with what? It deals with whether 
religious instructions can be imparted in educational institutions. So 28 article is not the right answer. Article 32 talks about right to constitutional remedies. Even this is not the right answer. Article 44 deals with uniform civil court. This is also not the right answer. So what is the correct answer? Article 14, rule of law. Rule of law would be violated if we are giving uncontrolled, unguided discretionary power to the administrative or executive authorities. So A is the right answer. Question number 10. Which one of the following in Indian polity is an essential feature that indicates that it is federal in character? The first discussion in polity lectures everywhere is whether India is a unitary constitution or a federal constitution. And therein we have discussed that federal constitution, we don't have a definition. We don't know what is a federal constitution. But what do we do then? Constitutional experts, they look at the American constitution. And if a constitution matches the US constitution, we call it federal. Because US, we consider, is the oldest federal constitution of the world. But what are these characteristics which make US constitution a federal constitution? Five important characteristics. Characteristic number one, dual government. One government at the center, other government in the states. Second, there has to be distribution of powers between the central and the state governments. So that is another important characteristic of a federal constitution. Third, written constitution. Fourth, constitution should not also be only be written, it should be supreme. That means supremacy of the constitution and it should also be rigid rigidity of the constitution but rigidity does not mean that constitution becomes very difficult to amend rigidity only means that if you have to amend the constitution it has to be the joint act of both center as well as states and the fifth important characteristics which makes u.s constitution a federal one is that judiciary should be independent so which one of the following in Indian polity is, is, is an essential feature that indicates that it is federal in character is that the independence of judiciary is safeguarded. A is the right answer. Let's look at question number 11. Which one of the following best defines the term state? Now this is where some of you might have felt an element of difficulty. But state, one comes under article 12. What is the definition of the state? But that definition of the state is with respect to fundamental rights or direct to principles of state policy. State as an entity, Max Weber's con uh, concept of state. What is that state? An important characteristic of a state is that it should occupy a definite territory and it should be independent of an external control. It should be sovereign and it should possess an organized government. This is the right answer. A is the right answer. But then how can you make out whether other options are incorrect or correct? Second, a politically organized people of a definite territory, possessing an authority to govern them, maintain law and order, protect their natural rights, safeguard their means of sustenance. This is the concept of an ideal state. Ideal state should do this. Preserve, maintain law and order, maintain the means of sustenance of the people. But that's an ideal state. The state necessary ingredient should be and has to be that it should be independent of an external control. It should be sovereign in its functioning. That is why A is the right answer. And C and D, they are, you can easily eliminate C and D. They cannot be considered as the answer to this question. So if at all you were confused, you would be confused between A and B. But one important line in these options independent of an external control. That's what makes option A the correct answer. Let's look at another question. With reference to Indian judiciary, consider the following statements. Purely factual. Any retired judge of the Supreme Court of India can be called back to sit and act as the Supreme Court judge by the Chief Justice of India with prior permission of the President of India. This is something that we discuss in judiciary. Purely factual. In fact, directly mentioned in Lakshmikant book as well. A high court in India has the power to review its own judgment 
as the Supreme Court does. This has been reiterated by the Supreme Court in numerous judgments that High Court also has this power and authority. So both these statements are correct. C is the right answer. With reference to India, consider the following statements. Some of you might have been confused here, but let's look at it differently. There is only one citizenship and one domicile. India follows single citizenship. You are only a citizen of India, no other state. And at the same time, you can only be the citizen of India and not of any other country. But sir, I can be a domicile of Maharashtra. I can be a domicile of Karnataka. I can be a domicile of Bihar. That's possible. But you can be domicile of only one state. If you are holding the domicile certificates of two states, it's a crime. And this is something that we have discussed multiple times in our classes as well. So we follow single citizenship and one domicile as well. Statement one is correct. A citizen by birth only can become the head of the state. This, if you would have watched our crash course, uh, we discussed this specifically. Constitution does not mention anywhere whether you should be a citizen by birth or citizen by naturalization or citizenship by registration or descent or by acquisition of foreign territory and only then you can occupy some post. No, the constitution only says that you should be a citizen. That is why this statement is incorrect. Citizen, regardless of whether you are a citizen by birth or descent or by incorporation of a foreign territory, you are in a position to occupy the position of the head of the state. A foreigner, once granted the citizenship, cannot be deprived of it under any circumstance. When a citizen can be deprived of his citizenship, why not a foreigner who has now acquired Indian citizenship? So clearly you would be in a position to say this statement is wrong. Which of the given statements is correct? A, one only is the right answer. Which one of the following factors constitutes the best safeguard of liberty in a liberal democracy? Committed judiciary. This was the slogan given by Srimati Indira Gandhi when she wanted committed judiciary, when she wanted committed bureaucracy. That means judiciary should be committed to the ideology of the political party in power. So a committed judiciary which favors the government of the day cannot be the safeguard for your liberty. So A can never be the right answer. Centralization of powers, no. Elected government, elected governments, even if you are an elected government, there is a tendency that you can be tyrannical as well. That's what Chief Justice of India said. Elections are no guarantee against tyranny of the elected government. That's why elected governments can violate your liberty. They cannot act as the safeguard of your liberty. What is it then the answer? Separation of powers. Separation of powers between executive and judiciary. When we say separation of powers, that means judiciary intrinsically is independent. Independent of executive, independent of legislature. And only an independent judiciary can be the safeguard for your liberty. That is why D is the right answer. Let's look at another question. We adopted parliamentary democracy based on the British model. But how does our model differ from that model? Number one, as regards legislation, the British Parliament is supreme or sovereign. But in India, the power of the Parliament to legislate is limited. This is something we have discussed in the crash course as well. This is something that we discuss in the classes as well. And I give you a quote. Uh, our students would know. I give you the quote of D. Lolme, wherein he says that British Parliament can do anything except convert a man into a woman and a woman into a man. That means the British Parliament is sovereign, it is supreme, it can do anything, it can pass any law. But that's not the power available with Indian Parliament. Indian Parliament is not sovereign. That means there is a limitation on the powers of the Parliament. It cannot violate basic structure of Indian Constitution. It cannot violate any provision of the Constitution. And whenever there is a law which is questioned in the Supreme Court based on violation of the Constitution, that particular case is referred to the Constitution bench. A judge bench strength of five or more judges hear that particular case. So in India, matters related to the constitutionality of an amendment of an act of the parliament are referred to the constitution bench by the Supreme Court. Both these statements are correct. C, both one and two is the right answer. Let's look at another question and I'll be very honest with you here. When I looked at this question, I could not answer. I had to search a lot 
to come out with an answer to this question. So this is something that we don't teach. Let's be honest with that. This is something which is purely factual, purely factual. Maybe in public administration someone would teach this, but this is something honestly I could not answer when I looked at the question paper. I don't know whether you were in a position to answer this. This is how some questions UPC frames in, a, in such a manner that nobody should be in a position to answer. And when I search for the answer, I could not get any reference anywhere regarding statement one. So we can safely say that statement one is not correct. In 1970, the Department of Personnel was constituted on the recommendation of the Administrative Reforms Commission 1966. And this was placed under the Prime Minister's charge. And you would know that when Prime Minister allocates portfolios, there are some portfolios which he keeps to himself. And one such department is DOPT, Department of Personnel and Training. So two statement is correct, one is not correct. So B, two only should be the right answer. Let's look at another question. Straightforward, simple question which anyone would be in a position to answer. Right to privacy is protected under which article of the Constitution of India? Article 21, K.S. Puttaswamy, judgment of 2017, wherein the Supreme Court had to decide whether right to privacy is a fundamental right or not. A nine-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court ruled that right to privacy is indeed a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution. And this was something which we directly discussed in the crash course as well. Let's look at another question. In India, there is no law restricting the candidates from contesting in one Lok Sabha constituency from three constituencies. Now, when we discuss electoral reforms, and one such electoral reform that we recommend, we suggest, is that the candidates right now are allowed to contest elections from two constituencies, maximum two constituencies, dealing with Section 33, Clause 7 of the Representation of the People Act 1951. But this section was added in the year 1996. Prior to 1996, there was no restriction from the number of constituencies a candidate could contest elections. But after 1996, there is a restriction. You can contest elections from up to two constituencies, not more than that. So in India, there is no law restricting the candidates from contesting in one Lok Sabha election from three constituencies is wrong. Statement two. In 1991, Lok Sabha election, Sri Devi Lal contested from three Lok Sabha constituencies. Now, please look at me carefully. Just by looking at the statement, don't change your preparation structure. Don't now assume and think that this is how we are going to study Indian polity. That means we have to remember and get the information about each and every contesting candidate or these big individuals, big political parties. No. UPSC is like your father, very tough from outside, but very caring inside. Whenever you look at such a statement, keep one thing in your mind, that even if you don't know whether the statement is correct or incorrect, this will not determine the answer to your question. That means the answer to this question, you will be in a position to figure out regardless whether you know this statement or not. I was not knowing the statement. I know Atal Bihari Vajpayee in 1950s contested from three constituencies, but I was not knowing that in 1991, Sri Devilal contested from three constituencies. So even if you don't know, on this basis, you will not be in a position to figure out the right answer. So this statement is immaterial for the answer to this question. You know statement one is incorrect. Now look at statement number three. As per the existing rules, if a candidate contests in one Lok Sabha election from many constituencies, his or her party should bear the cost of by-elections to the constituencies vacated by him. Now you know that this is not right. That is why we say that you should not be allowed to contest elections from two constituencies because it is a burden on state exchequer. Because we have to spend a lot of money for frequent elections. That's why we recommend this reform. So you know statement 1 and statement 3 is incorrect. Now look at the options. Which of the given statements is or are correct? One is not the answer. 2, maybe, 1 and 3, 2 and 3, so 3 is here, 3 is here, 1 is here, so 1, C and D can never be the answer. Now, what is the right answer? B, 2 only, which means it's correct. Shri Devi Lal contested in 1991 from three Lok Sabha constituencies. But this statement, even if you don't know, 
that will never determine the answer to your question. Regardless of that, you will be in a position to figure out the answer if you know statement 1 and statement 3. Correct? So that is it from Indian polity. We discussed close to 18 questions asked from Indian polity section, factual, conceptual, but safely we can assume that the questions asked from Indian polity were very easy and you would be in a position to accurately mark at least 16 questions if you are a serious aspirant. Over to my colleague Sham sir, now he will discuss the economics part of the prelims 2021 question paper. Thank you. to the questions which have been asked from economics. Now before I start the discussion, certain very important points. Many of you have kept calling me, mailing me, asking me, sir, what did you think about the question paper, especially regarding economics. I sincerely felt that the number of questions which have come generally around 15, yes, that has been maintained. Second, difficulty level. I felt that the difficulty level compared to last year was, was much lower this year. Many of the questions were straightforward. You have been listening to or reading the current affairs, you could have answered many of these particular questions. Certain questions from the static part also have been asked. So with this particular caveat, let me start the discussion related to Indian economics question paper. Let me start with the first question here. The money multiplier in an economy increases with which one of the following? First and foremost. What do you mean by money multiplier? Under the concept of banking, I am pretty sure you must have come across this. That is, RBI basically measures how much is the money multiplier in the economy. The different aggregates, monetary aggregates, M0, M1, M2, M3, M4. And related to this, what is the important point here? RBI basically measures, if I increase the money supply, let's say by 100 rupees, because of the fractional reserve system in the banking sector, this 100 rupees will create how much money or it will lead to creation of how much credit supply in the market. That is measured on the, under the concept of money multiplier. And the question is regarding this particular money multiplier. Let's look at the options here. Increase in the CRR, increase in the SLR. Let me club both of them. CRR and SLR. Whenever RB increases the CRR as well as SLR, what will happen? The money supply in the market is going to come down. Straightforward. Why? Under CRR, the bank will have to keep certain amount of money with RBI. Under SLR, it will keep it with itself, but it cannot invest, cannot give loans using this particular SLR amount. So if RBI increases both CRR as well as SLR, money supply is going to come down, not increase. So creation of money or creation of credit is not going to happen if the CRR, SLR is increased, A and B wrong. Increase in the banking habit of the people essentially means what? Imagine you're earning 100 rupees and earlier out of 100, you are keeping let's say 40 rupees in the bank. Now rather than keeping 40 rupees, you are keeping 80 rupees in the bank. As a result of this, can I simply say because of a fractional reserve system, banks are going to create more credit in the system. This particular 80 rupees is going to get circulated, right? After keeping certain amount of reserves, more loans will be created. So the M3, which is the most important money multiplier that we measure, M3 is going to expand. So option C is right. But let's eliminate the remaining one. Increase in the population of the country. If there is increased population, this might increase the money multiplier or might not increase the money multiplier. There is no guarantee with respect to this. 
right so i will basically eliminate option d option c is the right one here let me go to the next question with reference to indian economy demand pull inflation can be caused or increased by which of the following now earlier also we have discussed in current affairs videos crash course etc whenever you talk about inflation it could be caused because of supply side factors or it could be caused because of demand side factors and in the question they are focused on the concept of demand pull inflation and the demand pull inflation essentially discusses what the overall or aggregate demand in the market should increase so which of these particular following five points will lead to higher demand in the market find out let's start expansionary policies currently rbi government of india have been following expansionary policies wherein they are going to increase the money supply in the market with which we are expecting more demand to be generated in the market so first one correct fiscal stimulus whenever government provides a fiscal stimulus which essentially could be provided in the form of taxation policy in the form of expenditure etc through that government is going to increase its expenditure and it expects that the demand or the aggregate demand in the market will increase and if i have been following the discussion in the last one and a half years or two years this is exactly what the government of india has been doing best example atmanirbhar bharat policy so second one correct inflation indexing wages tricky why if the wages are kept constant you will simply say sir with inflation right with the rise in the inflation the demand will not increase because the wages let's say 100 rupees but the cost of goods and services is going to increase because of inflation but he is saying we are going to adjust the wages with inflation will it increase the aggregate demand in the market not necessarily why if the cost of the basket of commodities increase from 100 to 110 and your wages are also adjusted from 100 to 110 will you increase the consumption no you will continue to consume the same amount of goods and services which you will be able to attain or purchase in the market with 110 rupees so third one no fourth one higher purchasing power imagine you have 100 rupees with that particular 100 rupees you are able to purchase more goods in the market will it increase the demand in the market yes will it cause demand pull inflation in the market yes fourth one true fifth one rising interest rates whenever interest rates increase in the market understand this whenever interest rates increase in the market we expect the savings to increase consumption to come down so it will not increase the demand it will rather reduce the demand in the market right so fifth one wrong so first second and fourth right option will be option a 1 2 and 4 only let's look at the next question here with reference to india consider the following statements retail investors through dmat account can invest in treasury bills government of india debt bonds in primary market we have been discussing about this very often because rbi in the last year announced something called as retail direct gilt facility right rdgf and under that particular concept we have been discussing this yes first statement is true retail investors through dmat account dmat essentially means dematerialized account physical bonds are not issued anymore physical shares are not issued anymore dmat accounts are mandatory now so dmat account using that can you invest that is a retail investors can they invest and purchase government securities yes the statement is true the negotiable dealing system order matching nds om is a government securities trading platform of the reserve bank of india this statement is also true there are two points that you need to remember or you are supposed to remember now one is nds om and the other one is e kuber platform these are the two very important concepts in context of the government securities second statement true third one the central depository services cdsl is jointly promoted by reserve bank of india and the bombay stock exchange factual information i'll simply say this particular question is slightly difficult because first statement you would have known it second and third are purely from let's say the newspaper discussion so third statement it is wrong cdsl initially was set up or the promoter was a bombay stock exchange and over a period of time bse has divested some of its ownership to banking sector so third statement is wrong so first and second are true right option will be option b 1 and 2 only let's look at the next question here in india central banks function as the lender of last resort usually refers to which of the following straight forward very easy question 
but there is a temptation to get confused here. Why? Look at the third point. Let me start with the third point itself. Lending to governments to finance budgetary deficits. Yes, RBI provides, there is a provision under FRBM because of amendment in the last couple of years wherein RBI is allowed to provide loans that is basically purchase the G securities directly from the government, provide the loans to government of India. But can it be called as a lender of last resort because of this? No. If you go to RBI website, no RBI does not say this. So third statement is wrong. Second statement, providing liquidity to banks having a temporary crisis and this is a context where RBI is referred to as lender of the last resort because RBI is a regulator of banking sector. RBI is also referred to as a banker to banks and RBI is also referred to as a lender of last resort because whenever the commercial banks are fa facing certain liquidity crunch, they are having certain mismatches because of certain issues, financial issues under that particular context to protect the crash of this particular bank or to prevent the crash of this particular bank, RBI will provide certain assistance, provide loans to this particular bank. Hence, this is referred as a lender of last resort. First one, lending to trade and industry bodies when they fail to borrow from other sources. This should be a straightforward no for you for a simple reason, RBI does not lend directly to industry. It neither lends directly to industry, neither lends to retail borrowers in the market. It deals right through the banking sector with these kinds of borrowers in the market. So first one is wrong, second one is true, third one is again wrong, right option will be option B, only two is true. Next question, consider the following statements. The governor of Reserve Bank of India is appointed by the central government. This statement is true. Although within cabinet there is an appointments committee that will make uh, appointment of this particular RBI governor, it is part of the government itself. So first statement, true. RBI governor, deputy governors of RBI, all of them are appointed by government of India itself. Second statement, certain provisions in the constitution of India, underline the term constitution of India, give the central government the right to issue directions to the RBI in public interest. Very interesting statement, statement is wrong by the way. Why? Under RBI Act, there are various sections and in the last couple of years, one section has been discussed very vehemently and that is a section 7 of RBI Act of 1934. Under section 7 of RBI Act of 1934 and I will tell the context also, it was uh, during the discussion of surplus transfer between RBI to government of India. There was a discussion relating usage of section 7 by government of India. What does this particular section basically discuss? It basically states that if government of India wants in public interest, it can issue a direction to RBI. And in the public interest, if the direction is issued under this particular section, RBI does not have any option but to abide by this, to follow this particular guideline. So second statement, is it part of the constitution? No, it is given under the RBI Act of 1934. Third statement, governor of RBI draws his powers from RBI Act, definitely true. Under one of the sections, what are the functions of RBI? as well as the RBI governor, deputy governors, all of these particular functions are given in the RBI Act. So third statement, true. So first is correct, third one is correct, option C is the right one. Let us go to the next question. With reference to casual workers employed in India, consider the following statements. Now before I solve this, please understand, casual workers are basically those workers who do not have a standing agreement with the employer. That is, if you employ me, if there is no agreement, contract between both of us, that is basically a concept of a casual workers. But that does not mean that all the casual workers have no contract. There is a concept of contracted casual workers also. But the basic objective here is the state governments, individual state governments are supposed to pass the legislation to protect these particular casual workers. And in the recent times, with the passage of four courts, government of India wants to provide certain protection to these kinds of contract workers or casual workers. Let me start with the question here or statements. All casual workers are entitled for employees provident fund coverage. This was there in the discussion last year, there is a Supreme Court judgment on this, statement is true. All casual workers are entitled for regular working hours and overtime payment. I will be focused on the term regular working hours because whenever you talk about casual workers, the employer at a moment's notice or minute's notice can change or alter the working hours. There is no guaranteed working hours in case of casual workers. 
these can be hired whenever the employer or let's say manufacturer wants them or they can be removed whenever there is no need of these particular workers. So based on this, I'll simply say second statement wrong. The government can buy a notification, specify that an establishment or industry shall pay wages only through its bank account. This was there during demonetization discussion, statement is true. So 1 and 3 are correct, option C will be the right option here. Let me go to the next question. Which among the following steps is most likely to be taken at the time of economic recession? Underline the term most likely because there could be more than one points which will which could be taken by the government, but which of the following is most likely, which is the most preferred step. Let us start here. Cut in tax rates accompanied by increase in interest rates. Always understand this, in the last couple of years, there has been a discussion with respect to concept of counter-cyclical policy, counter-cyclical policy. And in this year's economic survey also, there has been a discussion with respect to the pro-cyclical as well as counter-cyclical policies. And whenever there is a recession in the economy, whenever there is a recession in the economy, what do you see? Private sector investment is very low. Private sector profits are coming down. The individuals, the household incomes are also coming down because people are losing their jobs. Right? In that particular scenario, in this particular scenario, which is categorically or technically could be called as a recession, what do you think government should do? Forget about options. What do you think government should do in this particular situation? Should government increase the tax rates or should government cut the tax rates? Your answer should be, sir, second one. Government should reduce the tax rates. So first we have attained one point, cut the tax rates. Okay, Cut the tax rates. And what do you think should happen to interest rates in the market? When the investments, investments are already down, what should happen to interest rates? Should interest rates be increased or should they be decreased? Interest rates should be brought down because you want people to take loans. You want people to consume in the market. So first point, cut in tax rates accompanied by increase in interest rates, wrong. Increase in expenditure on the public projects, statement is true, but let us eliminate the remaining two. Increase in tax rates, right, wrong. Reduction of expenditure on public project, this is also wrong. Even if you have not read about counter cyclical, etc., those kinds of policies, if you have just observed what government of India is doing in the last two years, you will realize that yes, B is the most appropriate statement. Why in the last two years, you can take example of national monetization pipeline or for that matter, Atma Nirbhar policy, national infrastructure pipeline, through all of these particular measures and many more, what do you think government of India is trying to do? Increase the expenditure on public projects. So option B is the right option for this particular question. Next question, consider the following statements, other things remaining unchanged, market demand for goods might increase if, let us start, price of substitutes increases, price of complement increases. Generally in case of economics, when you study about microeconomics, there is a concept of the related goods, okay? there is idea of a related goods, complementary goods and substitute goods are examples of related goods. For example, you want to purchase a mobile phone, if price of one company's phone increases, you will end up purchasing another mobile phone produced and sold by another company because this has become comparatively cheaper. So substitutes are set of goods which can be consumed individually. You do not have to combine or you do not have to consume all of them. If you purchase one mobile phone, that is more than sufficient. If you purchase, uh, let us say a car, more than sufficient. So these are nothing but some examples of substitute goods. So if price of the substitute increases, will the demand for the product increase? Definitely yes. Price of its complement goods increases. What do you mean by complement goods? Right? These are consumed in combination. You cannot consume them individually. You will have to combine them and consume them. Best example, printer and ink, right? vehicles and let us say fuel. You cannot consume them in individuality, you will have to combine them and consume them. If price of the vehicles increases, obviously consumption of vehicles will come down. What will happen to demand for fuel? If price of the printer increases, what do you think will happen to demand for let us say ink cartridges? Demand should come down. So if prices of its complement increases, demand for the product will come down. Second one is wrong. Good is an inferior good and income of the consumer increases. What is an inferior good? Inferior goods are those set of goods wherein 
the income increases demand decreases or else technically you can remember the demand and the income move in opposite direction if income increases demand decreases if income decreases demand increases and he says if the consumer's income increases what will happen to inferior good demand the demand will come down so third statement wrong its price falls law of demand application straight forward law of demand application law of demand basically states that if the price decreases demand should increase again i'm just giving a crude version of law of demand they use a technical term contraction and expansion there but essentially first one is correct fourth one is correct right option will be option a one and four only let's move to the next question here with reference to urban cooperative banks so much of discussion has been happening with respect to this in the last one year and finally the question has come so with respect to ucbs consider the following statements they are supervised and regulated underline the term regulated by local boards set up by the state governments yes it is true that until very recently the state government used to have a regulation or let's say a supervision over these particular ucbs and please understand when i say regulation it's not related to all the activities done by the ucbs it was restricted to the administrative activities is it okay the administrative activities are definitely a scheme under the state government what about the banking activities the banking activities earlier came under rbi and recently with amendment right 2020 amendment to banking regulation act in fact the rbi powers with respect to regulation of these particular ucbs has been increased so even earlier no the regulation of these particular ucbs was not entirely under the state governments there was a dual regulation and that was one of the problem which government of india has tried to address with the banking regulation amendment act of 2020 so first statement wrong they can issue equity shares and preferences definitely yes they are allowed to do that but again as per the latest amendment first rbi has to notify and only then these particular ucbs are allowed to issue them third one they were brought under the purview of a banking regulation act 1949 through an amendment in 1966 yes this particular is a factual statement and the statement is true so second and third are the right statements here correct option will be option b 2 and 3 only let's go to the next question indian government bond yields are influenced by which of the following and in the crash course also we have discussed this not necessarily the same question but we have discussed the concept of a yields and please understand it's a straight forward question the bond yields are influenced in the market by actions of the united states of federal reserve if you go back and please check the, the crash course videos there was a question of a federal reserve policy fed tapering and will it have an impact on the bond yields in case of india definitely yes statement is a true actions of the reserve bank of india gsap right we have discussed gsap we have discussed uh, the concept of uh, uh, various open market operation tools used by rbi will it have an influence on the bond yields of the government yes second statement is a true inflation and short term interest rates definitely yes third one is also true right so all the three are true right option will be option d 1 2 and 3 11th question consider the following foreign currency convertible bonds foreign institutional investment with certain conditions global deposit receipts and non resident external deposits which of the above can be included in foreign direct investment let me start with a caveat here generally when we discuss the concept of fccv or for that matter american deposit receipt global deposit receipts etc we discuss this in the context of foreign portfolio investment yes we discuss this in the context of a foreign portfolio investment fpi there are different routes right we will discuss these under the concept of fpi and i am pretty sure most of the books that you have used have discussed the concept of both of them under fpi and the upsc has played a trick here he has asked a question on fdi why very recently dpiit has brought in a new notification or fdi policy of the government in 2020 and as per that in certain situations fccbs gdrs and foreign institutional investments can be considered as a foreign direct investment now I'll simply ask sir what kind of a situation in the context of a fccb and a gdr if these are the instruments which are issued by indian companies let's say in the global market and there is no debt instrument which is given as a collateral in relation to these two 
in such situation these can be considered as a part of a foreign direct investment and in the context of a foreign institutional investment with certain conditions if a foreign institutional let us say from a foreign market invest in India purchases let us say 10 percent or less than 10 percent also in a particular company then the government says I will consider this as FDI if it is a 10 or more than 10 percent it is FDI and even if it is less than 10 percent but if you can promise me that in the next one year you will increase it to at least 10 percent I will consider this as FDI. So, foreign institutional investment with certain conditions yes. So, 1, 2 and 3 are correct right option will be option A here. Question number 12 consider the following statements the effect of devaluation of a currency is that it necessarily underline the term necessarily because let me start here first one improves the competitiveness of the domestic exports in the foreign markets will devaluation increase export competitiveness definitely yes understand the logic here he is speaking only from the context of devaluation if you had taken two parameters let us say devaluation or depreciation as well as inflation then the complexity would have increased he is talking only about devaluation if there is a devaluation what is likely to happen or which is necessarily an outcome of this first statement improves the competitiveness of the domestic exports in the foreign markets yes increases the foreign value of domestic currency no rather it is vice versa decreases the value of the domestic currency and the third one improves the trade balance this may or may not happen for a simple reason when you talk about trade balance you are talking about exports as well as imports so three likely no may or may not be so third one I will eliminate it so first one is more appropriate for this particular question so I will go with option A one only question number 13 which one of the following effects of uh, creation of black money in India has been the main cause of worry for government of India diversion of resources to purchase real estate and investment in luxury housing yes this is a concern but the question is uh, has been the main cause of worry right so I will just keep it on the side yes maybe one is uh, or A is correct but if more than one statements are true I will have to find out which is the which is the main worry for the government investment in unproductive activities and purchases of precious stones jewelry gold etc that is also found in case of the black money large donations of political parties and growth of regionalism right we will have to agree there is some influence of black money in, in let us say elections right so let us keep it on the side but look at the fourth statement loss of revenue to the state exchequer due to tax evasion what do you mean by black money right essentially black money is that money which is unaccounted by the government because it is unaccounted there is no way government knows how much income you are generating there is no way government will be able to tax you correctly so I will go with option D here loss of revenue to the state exchequer due to tax evasion is the most important worry it is the most important cause of concern for the government because of a generation of black money in the economy last question under the economics which of the following is likely to be the most inflationary in its effect again underline the term most inflationary repayment of the public debt government has borrowed it has repaid borrowing from the public to finance public or budget deficit yes it is inflationary borrowing from banks to finance a budget deficit is it inflationary yes but look at the fourth one creation of new money to finance a budget deficit remaining points yes they are causing inflation they are inflationary in the market there is no doubt regarding that but the question is which is most inflationary in case of uh, let us say B and C if you are having a doubt what government is doing is the money is already there in the system it is simply borrowing is it okay the money is already there in the system it is borrowing is it causing inflation yes but no new money is created because of government borrowing but look at the fourth option here option D or statement D creation of new money to finance budget deficit and whenever you talk about monetized deficit which we discontinued under FRBM 2003 but again in, in some ways we have introduced very recently under the monetized deficit the concern is exactly the same there could be creation of new money in the system which will cause a much more inflationary trend in the economy. So, option D is the right option which causes the most inflation or most inflationary out of all the four statements here. So, these are the foreign questions which have appeared from Indian economy or let us say economics in the UPSC prelims. Now, 
with respect to the next discussion on international relations, I will hand, hand it over to my colleague Chetan sir. Thank you. Hello everyone, now let's take up the IR questions that had appeared in today's paper. This time UPSC has given a little lower priority for international relations and only around four questions have come from this subject. But if you look at the four questions, all the questions they are static in nature but they are based on current developments. They have been triggered by recent developments of the last one, one and a half years. So let's go through the first question. Consider the following statements right to the city is an agreed human right and the UN habitat monitors the commitments made by each country in this regard. Right to the city gives every occupant of the city the right to reclaim public spaces and public participation in the city. Right to the city means that the state cannot deny any public service or facility to the unauthorized colonies in the city. See right to the city is a concept which was brought out in 1968 by a popular French philosopher and sociologist by the name Henry Lefebvre. This concept is rooted on the, on the basis of rights which have to be accorded to the citizens of a city, to the occupants of a particular city. It is based on the principle of social justice and this has been championed by the United Nations as well. The UN actually holds a conference once in every 20 years on housing and sustainable urban development. We call it the Habitat Conference. We had the first Habitat Conference in 1976. Then 20 years later, there was Habitat 2 in 1996. And recently in 2016, there was a third Habitat Conference. During these summits, a concept known as right to the city was being pushed by several countries. The proponents of this concept, they look at it as a part of human rights. It is considered to be a part of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Under this concept, it is believed that every occupant of a city, be it a genuine citizen, be it someone who is poor, be it someone who is from a slum, or be it the marginalized sections, or the weaker sections like women and children, or be it migrants and refugees, everybody should be given equal rights. They should have equitable, inclusive access to urban services like food, shelter, education, healthcare, etc. So this is essential, essentially the concept of right to the city. This concept has been pushed at the UN Habitat Conference and in the 2016 conference, a new urban agenda was also pushed. This would become the framework for urban governance and urban development in the coming decades. So at this conference, the right to the city concept was brought up and several countries were promoting, they were promoting it. But countries like India, countries like United States, Japan, the European Union countries, they all opposed the introduction of this concept as an international legal right. So this is what makes the first statement actually incorrect. See right to the city concept is a part of the discussion of human rights. But every country doesn't agree upon it. There is disagreement amongst the countries. It is still not part of any international convention and it is not part of any international obligation. So this clearly makes the first statement incorrect. So you can eliminate option A and C, but the other two statements are correct. It provides the right to every occupant to reclaim public spaces. It gives the right to participate in urban governance. It gives them the right to seek out urban services from the government, that is the local governments and it will also mandate the state, the governments to provide public services and facilities even to unauthorized colonies such as urban slums or refugee colonies as well. This is the reason why countries like India, US and European countries, they were opposed to this concept because they were not ready to provide 
these services as an international obligation. Right? They believe that these policies should be left to the discretion of the individual countries. That is why this concept was in news and every year it keeps coming back in current developments. So second and third statements are correct and the first statement is incorrect. So option D is the right answer. Now let's go to the second question. Consider the following statements. The Global Ocean Commission grants licenses for seabed exploration and mining in international waters. India has received licenses for seabed mineral exploration in international waters. And the third statement, rare earth minerals are present on seafloor in international waters. See, in this question, the first statement is incorrect because mining licenses for exploring seabed minerals is not given by the Global Ocean Commission. It is given by the International Seabed Authority, which is established under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is a topic that we have covered repeatedly in our classes and as well as in our CNA. Right? The Global Ocean Commission, on the other hand, it's a conservation initiative which was started in 2013. It ran for three years and it focused on highlighting the degradation of our oceans and its resources. So Global Ocean Commission doesn't deal with issuing mining licenses for seabed minerals. It is the International Seabed Authority. But however, the second and the third statements are absolutely correct. India has won the license for seabed mineral exploration in the central Indian Ocean Basin and as well as in the southwest part of the Indian Ocean region. See, on the seabed, you find a variety of minerals such as polymetallic nodules, right? Polymetallic nodules, they contain several precious metals and minerals along with your rare earth elements. These rare earth elements are considered of strategic significance because they are used in strategic industries like aerospace, defense, electronics, semiconductors, etc. So this is what makes the second and third statements correct. The reason why this question has been asked is because recently India launched the deep ocean mission, which again we had covered in the CNA. This was a project of the Ministry of Earth Sciences to explore and study the oceanic resources that are found, particularly on the seabed in the, in the deeper parts of the oceans. And just a few months back, India's Minister of Earth Sciences, he even informed the parliament that India had won exploration licenses from the International Seabed Authority to explore rare earth metals and polymetallic nodules and polymetallic sulphides in the central Indian Ocean basin and in the southwest part of the Indian Ocean. Because of these two current developments, this question has been asked. Okay? So the first statement is incorrect, two and three are correct, so that makes option B your right answer. Let's go to the next question. Consider the following statements. 21st February is declared to be the International Mother Language Day by UNICEF. The demand that Bangla has to be one of the national languages was raised in the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. Which of the above statements are correct? This is again a topic which we have covered under India-Bangladesh relations. We have even spoken about the International Mother Language Day in our daily CNA. See, this day was marked not by UNICEF, but by UNESCO. It was endorsed by UNESCO in the year 1999. Later, it was even recognized by the UN General Assembly. So that makes your first statement incorrect. But 21st Feb every year is marked and celebrated as the International Mother Language Day. This part of the statement is correct. But it was recognized not by UNICEF, but by UNESCO. This day is related to the history of Bangladesh. See, back in 1947, when India and Pakistan were granted independence, the two dominions were set up, right? The Pakistani dominion comprised of West Pakistan and as well as East Pakistan. So from 1947-48 itself, the Bengali minorities of East Pakistan, they were raising a demand for including the Bangla language or the Bengali language as a national language of Pakistan and these demands were made in front of the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. In fact, it was Mr. Dinendranath Dinendra Datta who was one of the first 
leaders to raise this issue. This language movement, which began in East Pakistan, it went on for several years. It went on until 1952. And in 1952, on the 21st of Feb, there was a massive protest that was organized by the native Bengalis of East Pakistan. The Pakistani police and their security forces, they cracked down on these protests. And in this crackdown, several protesters were injured and killed as well. This day is marked by Bangladesh after gaining independence in 1971 as the Mother Language Day. It's a national holiday in Bangladesh. Later, it brought up the issue at the United Nations, pushed UNESCO to recognize the 21st of February as the International Mother Language Day. So it is celebrated every year. It basically promotes linguistic and cultural diversity of the world and brings up the issues of linguistic minorities as well. So that makes option B the right answer, two only. There's also one more reason why this question has been asked. 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. Because of all these developments, this question has been picked on the history of Bangladesh. Going to the fourth question, with reference to water credit, consider the following statements. It puts microfinance tools to work in the water sanitation sector. It is a global initiative launched under the aegis of WHO and the World Bank. It aims to enable poor people to meet their water needs without depending on subsidies. See, the water initiative or the water credit initiative was started by a global NGO known as water.org. A global non-profit organization started this initiative. Hence, your second, second statement is incorrect. It was not started by WHO and World Bank. It was started by a global NGO known as water.org. This foundation was started by popular Hollywood actor Matt Damon and as well as a social entrepreneur known as Gary White. They started this initiative as a not-for-profit initiative. And this initiative is aimed at providing micro-credit or small loans through microfinance institutions. The objective is to help out the poor communities, especially in rural areas, to access water and sanitation services. Sometimes for the poor communities, the support given by the government may not be enough to access clean water and basic sanitation. So without depending on government subsidies, they can borrow small sums of money, micro credits can be taken from microfinancing institutions so that these people can gain access to clean water and sanitation services. That is the purpose of the water credit initiative, which was started by water.org. So statements one and three are correct. Option C is the right answer. So this completes our discussion on international relations. Now, we come to the bouncer in today's paper. There were three questions related to sports. And I'm sure it would have surprised every aspirant. Because in the last many years, UPSC has never asked a factual, trivial sports question in prelims. Yes, in mains, there have been few questions. But they have been from an administrative perspective. right? There have been questions in essay paper. There have been questions in, in mains as well regarding anti-doping, regarding the corruption scandal in BCCI, etc. But those questions were from an administrative point of view. UPSC never goes for trivial factual questions in general. But this year, UPSC has surprised everyone. right? UPSC is known to do that. And there have been three factual sports questions. So let's look at them. Consider the following statements in respect of the Laureus World Sports Award, which was instituted in the year 2000. Now first, let me tell you why this award was in news. Last year, Sachin Tendulkar was awarded for the best sporting moment in the last two decades. I'm sure you remember the 2011 World Cup. India won the World Cup and after the celebrations began, the Indian cricket team members, they lifted Sachin Tendulkar and carried him on their shoulders. It was an iconic moment. This particular sporting moment has been voted as the best sporting moment of the last two decades in the world. That is why this award was in news and UPSC has picked a factual question from this. Generally, these questions appear in your state PCS or in your grade B SSB exams. This is a very rare thing for UPSC to ask such questions in civil services. 
but UPSC is known to surprise us. We have to be prepared as well and that is how you have to approach current affairs as well. So let's look at this question. There are three statements given. American golfer Tiger Woods was the first winner of this award. The award was received mostly by Formula 1 players so far. Roger Federer received this award maximum number of times compared to others. Here the second statement is incorrect. Yes, it was Tiger Woods who got the inaugural award in 2000. The award has been received most number of times by tennis players, not by Formula 1 players. And Roger Federer has received the maximum number of awards. So statements 1 and 3 are correct. Option C is the right answer. The second question. Consider the following statements in respect of the 32nd Summer Olympics. Again, a current affairs based development. India performed really well at this year's Summer Olympics. So that is probably what has inspired this question. The 32nd Summer Olympics was held in Tokyo and there are two statements given based on the Olympic event. The official motto for this Olympics is a new world. Sport climbing, surfing, skateboarding, karate and baseball are included in this Olympics. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect but the second statement is correct. So option B would be the right answer. See the motto for the Summer Olympics which was supposed to be held actually in 2020 was united by emotion. This was the initial motto given last year. But after the pandemic broke out, the Olympics was postponed to this year and the motto was also updated. The official motto was faster, higher, stronger together. So clearly the first statement is incorrect. But this year, the sports mentioned over here, they have been included in the Olympics. That makes the second statement correct. So option B is your right answer. Coming to the last question, there is a question on the test championship, the world test championship. Consider the following statements. The finalists were decided by the number of matches they won. New Zealand was ranked ahead of England because it won more matches than England. Here, both the statements are incorrect. Option D is the right answer. See, India and New Zealand played the, the finals of the ICC World Test Championship. The finalists were selected on the basis of percentage points. Any cricket fan or any person who follows current affairs regularly, sports related news, they would be aware of this. It was not just based on the number of victories, but the percentage points were calculated based on the number of matches won, the number of matches drawn, the over rate and other factors. So that is why the first statement is incorrect. Finalists were not decided just on the basis of matches that were won. It was on the basis of percentage points. And New Zealand got ahead of England and entered the finals, not because it won more matches, it had actually won lesser matches than England, but it had higher percentage points than England. So that makes both statements incorrect. Option D is the right answer. So these are the questions we had got from IR and the miscellaneous topics, that is from the sports section. With this, I would conclude my discussion. Thank you for watching. Now I would hand over the session to Mukesh sir, who would take up a discussion on geography questions and environment ecology questions. Thank you. Hello, a very warm good evening to all of you and welcome to the discussion regarding the questions which have appeared from geography as well as environment and ecology. Now we shall be discussing each of these questions, what can be the possible solution to it and if possible we shall also be throwing some light into why that question has appeared and also we shall be talking about the difficulty level of the question. But before that, taking an overview if you compare the subject of geography with the previous year, we can easily say that the subject has been comparatively easier as compared to the last year. Many of the questions which have been asked are direct and straightforward and deal with important concepts. So without further ado, let us start with the discussion of questions which appeared in geography. 
starting with the first question. The vegetation of savanna consists of grasslands with scattered small trees, but extensive areas have no trees. The forest development in such areas is generally kept in check by one or more of a combination of certain conditions. Which of the following are such conditions? So the question is about the whole ecosystem of savanna. Savanna, as you know, as per Köppen's classification is also referred to as tropical wet and dry climate, has got certain scattered trees and in between them you have large areas of grasslands. Now this kind of an ecosystem also has as its natural habitat many of the large animals residing in the area, mostly herbivores including giant elephants. African elephants, Asian elephants, all of them. So let us take a look at the possible options and the conditions. So the first condition is burrowing animals and termites. Now burrowing animals and termites, they can lead to weathering of rocks, they can lead to fertility of soil, aeration of soil, but they would not be responsible for having lesser number of trees altogether. So the first condition is incorrect. Now, Perpetually, when you take a look at such kinds of questions, always it is advisable that whenever we are sure that a particular statement is incorrect, we should start eliminating the options along with it. So we know that the first statement is incorrect. So let us eliminate all the options where one is mentioned. Now, the second one, fire. So because these conditions and such ecosystems are so dry in nature. There is a scarcity of rainfall for majority of the part of the year. That is why natural fires are a common occurrence. Many of the times you also come across the events of bushfires. Now when such fire incidents are observed or are experienced, automatically that brings about clearances of many of the trees in that area and the grasses, they regenerate, they thrive themselves again. And again, when the dry season comes, these dry grasses can act as the perfect cinder for igniting another fire. So yes, fire is the correct condition. Now here again, if you analyze that two is correct, automatically you will be able to eliminate another option here and you shall be left with the correct option. But anyways, let us take a look at the rest of the conditions. Then we have grazing herbivores. So grazing herbivores such as many of the large elephants, they are particularly responsible for having a larger grassland area. Many of the smaller tea sap uh, tree saplings rather, they are consumed by these elephants at the get-go at their very younger stage. So that doesn't allow the tree cover to expand exponentially. So yes, grazing herbivores is the correct option. Then you have seasonal rainfall. So here seasonal rainfall refers to a sporadic intervention of rainfall spread over a larger part of the year. So the rainfall that is received is restricted actually to very few months. And for the remaining part of the year, the condition is generally dry. So that is where seasonal rainfall is also responsible for dry grasses to be present in this region. So fourth is also correct. And if you look at the fifth, soil properties, well soil properties are not such a controlling factor. Soil oftentimes is a product of the surrounding ecosystem. So rainfall conditions, the conditions regarding weathering, all of them, many of the times, they are responsible for a particular soil type. So soil properties is not the correct option in this. So the correct answer in this case will be 2, 3 and 4 only. So that shall be option C. Okay. Now overall, you can actually categorize this question into an easier category because once you know what a savanna type of ecosystem is, very easily you can actually extrapolate that to understand how that has been created or in what ways that is facilitated. Now, the next question. 
with reference to the water on the planet Earth, consider the following statements. Now this question has been asked and this question is about the fresh water distribution that we experience on the planet. Now if we take an overall look at the fresh water distribution across the planet, then the planet as a whole has only 3% fresh water. Rest of it is saline water. Now in this 3% or amongst this 3%, close to around 69% of fresh water is present actually in polar ice caps and glaciers. Then you have another 30% being present in the form of groundwater. And the remaining 1 to 2% is actually to be found in the form of different types of lakes, rivers, swamps, etc. So now let us take a look at the statements which have been given. The first statement is, the amount of water in the rivers and lakes is more than the amount of groundwater. This is incorrect. If you take a look at the overall global distribution of fresh water, the amount of water in the rivers and lakes is very, very low in comparison as we have seen here. Only around 1%, 1 to 2% is actually distributed in all the various different lakes, rivers, swamps, bogs, etc. Then, the amount of water in polar ice caps and glaciers is more than the amount of groundwater. This is correct. Because, as you can see, around 69% of fresh water is to be found in the polar ice caps and also in the glacial flows. So here, the option B, that is 2 only, shall be taken and can be considered as the correct answer. This again can be put to medium to easy category, provided you have some idea about the distribution of water resources across the globe. Then. The next question. Now this question is about two different plant types or plant species. So starting with the first statement and the question in itself is consider the following statements and we have to find out which of the statements are actually correct. So looking at the first statement, Moringa or Dumstrick tree is a leguminous evergreen tree. Now Moringa is actually a leguminous plant. That is true. So this portion is correct, but it is not an evergreen tree. Oftentimes, it is actually categorized in the category of deciduous, as a deciduous tree. So the first statement is incorrect. Now here again, do repeat the same process. Eliminate all the options where one is marked as correct. So if you do that, one is present in three of the options. So you can easily end up eliminating three incorrect options. This year, in fact, majority of the questions have been such and have been framed in such a way that if you are good at eliminating and logical elimination, you will be able to reach the answer very easily. Looking at the second statement. Tamarind tree is endemic in South or to South Asia. Now, during our crash course series, we had discussed what is the meaning of endemism, and we have we had actually concluded that endemism can be referred to only such plants or trees which are to be found only in a certain area and not in any other part of the globe. Now, when you consider the tamarind tree, Tamarind can actually be found in various parts of Africa. It is actually native to Africa. It can be found in parts of Central America as well. So the second statement also shall be incorrect. The third statement, in India, most of the tamarind is collected as a minor forest produce. Now minor forest produce and fixing the price of it, again, was covered in the crash course. But then, 
most of the tamarind production in India takes place in the tribal areas. And it has proven to be one of the major economic supports of the hitherto backward sections and the ignored sections of the society. And it is included in the minor forest produce. So this is correct. The fourth statement. India exports tamarind and seeds of moringa. That is again true. So India has a wide basket of agro exports and tamarind and moringa are important ones amongst them. The fifth one. Seeds of moringa and tamarind can be used in the production of biofuel. So again, this is correct. This can be used in the production of the second generation of biofuels. I hope that you are aware that there are various different generations of biofuels. So these actually fall under the category of second generation of biofuels. So this is again a correct statement. So the correct answer in this case will be 3, 4 and 5. In fact, even if you were not sure of the third, fourth, or even the fourth or the fifth statement, you could have reached the answer very easily by the process of elimination. Overall, you can place this question in the medium category. Then, moving on to the next question. The black cotton soil of India has been formed due to the weathering of A. Brown forest soil B. Fissure volcanic rock C, granite and schist, and D, shale and limestone. Now, first of all, black cotton soil, where is it found in predominance? In the region of Deccan Traps. And we know that in the region of Deccan Traps, as India as a subcontinent was moving towards its present position, while India was placed over the region of Reunion Islands, which is a volcanic hotspot, there was a significant amount of volcanic eruption and basaltic lava came out. So, those rocks finally disintegrated to form the black cotton soil. So, in this case, the answer shall be fissure volcanic rock. Okay? These are the ones which are responsible. These are basically igneous rocks. And this is the reason why black cotton soil is lacking in the presence of organic matter. Because in igneous rocks, generally the soil which is formed as a result of disintegration or weathering of igneous rocks, those types of soils, you will find that they lack organic materials. Okay? So the answer in this case shall be B. Now, moving on to the next question. Now, this question was regarding permaculture. And a comparison of permaculture with the conventional method of agriculture. The chemical application of uh, fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, that is the conventional agriculture that you follow. Permaculture is basically a kind of land management where you look forward to a sustainable management of land, ensuring that there is a self-sustaining nature to the agricultural practices and the crops are grown in accordance with the environmental demand in that region. So, how is permaculture farming different from conventional chemical farming? The first statement. Permaculture farming discourages monocultural practices, but in conventional chemical farming, monoculture practices are predominant. What is this monoculture practice? That is where you end up growing the same kind of crop year after year. And in this way, you don't allow the soil to regain its fertility. Permaculture ensures that in the same piece of land or in a larger area, you have multiple different types of crops, legumes, etc., which grow so that a natural recharge of soil fertility is already taken care of. So in this, the first statement is correct. Now, the second statement. Conventional farm, chemical farming can cause increase in soil salinity, but the occurrence of such phenomena is not observed in permaculture farming. So again, this statement is correct. Why is this correct? Because under conventional chemical farming, 
due to application of excessive amount of fertilizers, you need to provide huge amount of water as well. And excessive amount of irrigation or over irrigation leads to an exponential amount of evaporation from the soil, bringing all the dissolved nutrients to be settled as a hard layer on the top soil. And that is what makes the soil saline. The regions of Haryana, Punjab, Western UP, etc., they are actually suffering this issue. So here, this statement is again correct. The third statement, conventional chemical farming is easily possible in semi-arid regions. Now this is incorrect. Because in semi-arid regions, that is the main problem that our country is facing right now. Because in semi-arid regions, as the amount of rainfall is changing drastically, rainfall pattern is changing, the conventional farming techniques are actually failing the farmers, leading to a further reduced farm income. So this statement is incorrect. Okay? Now, here again, this was the crucial statement where if you apply the normal logic, you could easily find out that the conventional farming, the problem that India is facing, has to do with semi-arid regions where irrigation has not reached. And if you look at the options available, if you end up eliminating where option 3 is given, automatically you will end up eliminating two of the four options. Then the fourth statement, practice of mulching is very important in permaculture farming, but not necessarily so in conventional chemical farming. Now, what is this practice of mulching? Mulching is when you cover the topsoil with dead straws, plant matter, etc., so as to maintain the soil fertility, so as to help the soil retain its moisture level, and also to prevent any excessive rise of temperature or fall in temperature in the soil. So that is a way to maintain the integrity of the soil. This is followed vigorously in permaculture. But in conventional farming, you will find that this is not a necessary or a prerequisite condition. So here, the correct statements are 1, 2 and 4. So that makes option B as the correct answer. After that, moving on to the next question. The next question is, with reference to palm oil, consider the following statements. Now, palm oil has been in many news cycles throughout the past one year regarding the imports of palm oil from regions such as Malaysia, Indonesia, our dependency on palm oil, the utility of palm oil, etc. In fact, the government had also recently launched the National Mission on Oil Palm. So we have covered that under webinars, various different classes as well. So here, if you take a look at it, the first statement, palm oil tree is native to Southeast Asia. Now, while palm oil is grown in the largest amount, in the largest quantity in Southeast Asia, but it is not native to Southeast Asia. In fact, it is found to be native to the region of Western Africa. So in this, the first statement is incorrect. Now, again, follow the same exercise. Wherever you have option one, which is deemed to be correct, eliminate those options. Now, looking at the second statement, the palm, palm oil is a raw material for some industries producing lipstick and perfumes. This is true. In fact, in many of our toiletries products, such as you have hand washers, soaps, then conditioners, shampoos, etc., in all of these, palm oil is an important ingredient. That is why it is used in such a large quantity across the globe. So the second statement is actually correct. The third statement, the palm oil can be used to produce biofuel. Again, a very correct statement, and that is one of the major usages of palm oil, especially in the regions of Western Europe. While in areas such as Southeast Asia, 
Latin America, etc. Palm oil is used for a variety of purposes. In many parts of the Europe, it is primarily used for producing the biofuel. So here again, you have 2 and 3 as the correct statement. So that makes again option B as the correct answer. Moving on to the next question. The next question, with reference to the Indus River system, of the following four rivers which have been given, three of them pour into one of them which joins the Indus direct. Among the following, which one is such river that joins the Indus direct? Now here, many of the candidates have been facing some amount of confusion since the time that they have exited the exam hall. And the chief confusion is between Chinab and Satluj. But here, if you take a look at the question and the framing of the sentences carefully, here it says clearly that three of these rivers, they empty themselves into the fourth river. Now, if you consider River Satlaj, River Satlaj only has River Bias which enters there. So that is where it will be incorrect. And rest of them, Jhelum and Ravi, they actually merge with the river Chenab itself. So when you consider river Chenab, river Chenab will have all the major rivers that is Jhelum, uh, Ravi and even Satlaj which meets river Chenab and then finally Chenab meets river Indus at Mithan Court in Pakistan. This is where river Chenab meets the river Indus before flowing itself into the Arabian Sea. So in this, the correct answer shall be A, that is Chinna. Here you had to notice the framing and if you put significant attention to that, then this question was also a kind of a question which could be solved easily. Now, the next question. With reference to India, Didwana, Kuchaman, Sargol and Khatu are the names of. Now these are the regions which are present in the area around the western part of the country. Western and the slightly northern central part of the country. Now all these are actually salt water lakes. And because of high amount of evaporation and the less amount of precipitation received in these areas, the salinity level is significantly on the higher end of the spectrum. So all these are actually saline lakes. Now when you consider the other options, that is glaciers, clearly in the western and the central part of the India, you don't have the existence of glaciers because Didwana out of all these is the most famous one out of them. You have important wildlife living in that area as well. So that is why here the answer is saline lakes. But then in order to solve this question, you need to be aware of these names. So because it is a kind of a factual trivia kind of a question, you can place it into the difficult category of the question set. Now, moving on to the next question. The next question is, Consider the following rivers, Brahmani, Nagavali, Subarnarekha and Vamsdhara. Which of the above rise from the Eastern Ghats? Now in order to solve this question, one needs to be aware of the location where these rivers end up flowing. So if you take a look at the broader map of the peninsular India, a rough map of the peninsular region, the rivers Subarnarekha and Brahmani, they originate from the area of Chota Nagpur Plateau. It is true that they end up flowing into the Bay of Bengal. They end up flowing through the region of the Eastern Ghats, but they do not originate in the region of Eastern Ghats. So here, you will have Brahmani and Subarnarekha as the incorrect ones. Nagavali and Vamsdhara, these are the river systems which exist in the region of Andhra Pradesh, Urissa and that part of the Eastern Ghats. So here, both of them are actually correct. 
So here the correct answer shall again be B that is 2 and 4 only. Here you have to be aware of the location. So if you look at Subarna Rekha, Subarna Rekha flows through the region of Jamshedpur in Jharkhand which is very much a part of Chota Nagpur Plateau. And if you look at that, that in itself gives you a significant amount of clue that which option is going to be correct. Okay? Now, moving on to the next one. Among the following, which one is the least water efficient crop? Now, if you take a look at the crops which have been listed, then sugarcane, sunflower, pearl millet and rut gram. Now, out of these, sunflower, pearl millet and red gram, these are the ones which are generally grown in the practice of dry land farming. One is a kind of a pulse, one is a kind of a millet. So these are the ones which are generally used in dry land farming techniques. And here, irrigation is not needed for the successful growth of these plants. But when we talk about sugarcane, sugarcane as a crop requires close to around 100 to 120 centimeters of water which needs to be available during its growing season. And that is why sugarcane requires huge amount of water and an assured supply of irrigational facilities. So here the correct answer is going to be sugarcane. Here again, this question along with the other questions of agriculture that you have encountered, they deal with the same problems of agriculture, either farm income, sustainability, or dry land farming, the problems that plague our farming community to the present day. So here again, this can be categorized as an easy question, provided you knew the conditions required for sugarcane. Even previous year, UPSC had asked a question regarding the conditions required by a crop. Previous year, it had asked a question regarding cotton. This year, it had asked a question regarding sugarcane. Now, that being said, moving on to the next question. The next question is, consider the following statements. Now, this is a question regarding conceptual clarity for the flow of the permanent winds, the direction in which they flow, and the characteristics thereby. So, the first statement. In the tropical zone, the western sections of the oceans, western sections of the oceans, are warmer than the eastern sections owing to influence of trade winds. Now, when you consider trade winds, in each of the hemispheres, let's say this is the equator, the trade winds, let's assume that you have a land mass somewhat like this, here also, let us assume you have a landmass somewhat like this. Just a rough estimation. Now, if we consider the trade winds, these trade winds have a general direction of northeast to southwest in the northern hemisphere. And they have a direction of southeast to northwest in the southern hemisphere. Now, the direction of these winds, what it brings into play is an accumulation of warm water in the western part of the oceans. And this leads to a process of downwelling. And thereby increasing the sea surface temperature in that area. So the first statement is going to be correct. Now looking at the second statement. The second statement is in the temperate zone that is beyond the tropics. Now in the temperate zone, which wind type is prevalent? It is the westerlies, which are very prevalent in the temperate zone. So looking at the statement, in the temperate zone, westerlies make the eastern sections of oceans warmer than the western sections. So here if you, let's say that you assume the region above as the temperate zone, you will find that the movement of wind is from the west to east direction. It shall lead to downwelling 
in the eastern portion of the ocean and shall make the eastern section of the ocean comparatively warmer as compared to the western section. And that is what makes the second statement as correct as well. This is the reason why the sections of England, United Kingdom, etc., they have along their coastline a significantly warmer water accumulated. Along with the ocean currents, this is one of the major reasons. So in this case, you have both 1 and 2, that is correct. So the answer shall be C, that is both 1 and 2. Now after that, moving on to the last question. Now this question is about a particular forest type. So leaf litter decomposes faster than in any other biome and as a result the soil surface is often almost bare. That means decomposition rate is very fast. Apart from trees, the vegetation is largely composed of plant forms that reach up into the canopy vicariously by climbing the trees or growing as epiphytes. Epiphytes here represents what? Wherever you have availability of water or the, those kinds of trees or climbers, small shrubs which can climb with the help of a support rooted on the upper branches of the trees. This is the, the most likely description of A, coniferous forest, B, dry deciduous forest, C, mangrove forest or D, tropical rainforest. Now amongst all these options, if you look at it, then it is the tropical rainforest which has the maximum availability of moisture, humidity, rainfall and hence the maximum growth of plant species. It is also in these areas where the height of the canopy that you find is significantly higher. And also it is in these areas where you will end up finding that the rate of decomposition is so quick because of perpetual availability of humidity and moisture in the air surrounding it. So here the correct answer shall be D that is tropical rainforest. So again you can put this question into easy category. It was a very basic portion of geography. Now overall out of these 12 questions which have appeared, if you would have gone through the basics, if you were regular at current affairs, not that much but slightly so, you could have easily got around 9 to 10 questions correctly. So overall, I would like to categorize the geography paper as moderate to an easier category, okay? Now, after this, coming to the questions which appeared from the region of environment. Now this year, close to around 16 questions have been asked from environment itself. Now here again, if you have slight kind of a cross domain knowledge from geography and environment, problem solving becomes significantly easier, okay? Let us take a look at these questions which have appeared from environment. Now the first question, statement 1, the F, it has been FAO which has been responsible and along with the Arbor Day Foundation, FAO is responsible for awarding the tree city. So the first statement is incorrect. Second statement, Hyderabad was selected for the recognition for a year following its commitment to grow and maintain the urban forests. Now this award has been given not only depending upon the present day practices and policies but also the commitments that the cities have indicated moving ahead into the future. So the second statement is actually correct. Overall, if you look at the options which are available, which of the following is correct in respect to the above statements, you will find that option D is the most suitable. That is, statement 1 is not correct, but statement 2 is rather correct. So here the answer shall be option D. Now, moving on to the next question. But before that, again, this was very much in the news cycle. 
So here, UPSC has played with FAO or UNCDF. And this is where you have to apply maximum concentration while appearing for the examination. Otherwise, these silly mistakes can be a very common occurrence. Then, again, another question which has been taken from the current affairs aspect. In the context of India's preparation for climate smart agriculture, now what is this concept of climate smart agriculture? Climate smart agriculture dealt with the aspect of having a sustainability in the process of agricultural production, keeping in mind the sporadic occurrences of rainfall and a changing rainfall pattern as well. So that is what is climate smart agriculture. Agencies in India and research organizations are working here so as to make each and every area self-sufficient in water management and also raising the awareness that what kind of crops can be grown provided the agroecological climatic condition prevalent in a certain region. Now looking at the first statement, the climate smart village approach in India is a part of the project led by Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, CCAFS, an international research program. This is correct because this is one of the programs which has been run to make the village self-sufficient. Okay? Now, the project of CCAFS is carried out under Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, CGIAR, headquartered in France. This is again a correct statement. CGIAR runs many such different programs. All of them deal with the sustainability of agriculture and maintaining the agroecological climatic balance in an area. Then the third statement, the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics or ICRISAT in India is one of the CGIAR's research centers. And as I said, various different organizations are working on this. Now here the main fight has been, or the main battle so as to say, has been to ensure that crops do not fail in a season where, let's say, the amount of rainfall has reduced. So that is why you have such kind of a program which is run and researches are being done that which crops can be grown, what is the minimum adequate amount of water which can be supplied, is there any other intervention in the form of manures, fertility, etc. which can be provided. So this is again a correct statement. So here you will find that 1, 2 and 3 are the correct statements. Now, because this question had many such factual portions, many such portions involving various different bodies, that is why this question is one which you can very easily put into a difficult to very difficult category. Here, because even the option placement, 1 and 2 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3, that was meant to confuse the candidates. And I'm sure many of the candidates would have found it very difficult. You, are, you don't have to be discouraged by these questions. Please understand, UPSC put certain questions deliberately that it doesn't expect the candidates to solve as well. So I would like to place this into a difficult to very difficult category. Moving on to the next question. Consider the following kinds of organisms. Copepods, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and also foraminifera which of the above are primary producers in the food chain of oceans? Now, here, if you consider copepods, these are basically small crustaceans, very small crustaceans that feed on certain matter which are very small floating in the oceanic water. So obviously, these are not primary producers. These can be categorized in the portion of consumers. So this is incorrect. The second, cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is a unicellular producer. It utilizes light source available to it and it has the capacity, some of the cyanobacteriums, they have the capacity to undertake photosynthesis. So cyanobacteria is correct. 
diatoms, they are also algal species and algal species also end up producing their own food and they are at the bottom end of the food chain. So, 2 and 3 here are correct. Now, if you take a look at the options, you will automatically end up finding that B is the correct one. But anyways, looking at foraminifera. Foraminifera are basically small kinds of amoeboids or amoebas. Now, they do not end up producing, they end up consuming rather. So, here this can be eliminated as the incorrect statement. So, overall you have 2 and 3 which are the correct one and hence the answer in this shall be B. Now, again if you have to categorize this, this can be categorized to medium to difficult if you are not aware of what diatoms are or what cyanobacterium are. Now, consider the following statements. Hedgehog, or consider the following animals rather, hedgehog, marmot and pangolin. To reduce the chance of being captured by predators, which of the above organisms roll up and protects itself and its vulnerable parts? So the question is which of the animals when they are faced with a threat or a danger, they end up rolling themselves into a kind of a spherical like structure so that the predators are unable to attack them, their soft underbelly, etc. So out of these, you will find hedgehog and also pangolin, they are the most suitable ones which can actually practice that. Marmot is a kind of a groundhog, it is a kind of a rodent which does not undertake this particular activity. So hedgehog and pangolin, now here pangolin is one of those animals which has been in relevance ever since the outbreak of COVID-19. And that is why pangolin has been covered in multiple news cycles throughout the past year. So it was very much on the expected lines that a question was to be asked regarding pangolins, their diet, what do they eat, the ecosystem that they survive in. But rather, as is the case with UPSC, UPSC threw up an unexpected bouncer, so to say, and actually asked the candidates the properties or the phenomena exhibited by these animals. So in this case, 1 and 3 only, that is answer D, is the correct answer. Now, moving on to the next question. With reference to the New York Declaration on Forests, which of the following statements are correct? First statement, it was first endorsed at the United Nations Climate Summit held in 2014. This is correct. So it was actually Ban Ki-moon who actually initiated this summit. So this is a correct statement. Second. It endorses a global timeline to end the loss of forests. This is again correct. Because this declaration on forests was actually one which had set itself ambitious goals that by the year 2020, we should achieve around 50% reduction in the natural forest loss. And by the year 2030, we shall reach the level of 0% natural forest loss. So it had set itself an aggressive timeline. So here 1 and 2 are correct. Now take a look at the options. You will find there is only one option where both 1 and 2 have been listed as correct. So here you could reach the answer directly. Anyways, it is a legally binding international declaration. This is incorrect. It is not legally binding. Very few agreements or very few declarations are actually internationally binding. Then, the fourth one. It is endorsed by governments, big companies and also indigenous communities in various areas of the globe so as to ensure sustainable protection of the forest ecosystem. So, this is also correct. Fifth, India was one of the signatories at its inception. This is incorrect. Majority of the signatories at its inception were 
the American countries, that is North and the South American countries, African countries, few of them, and also few of the European nations. India did not figure out there. So this is incorrect. So the correct answer in this case shall be A, that is 1, 2, and 4 only. Here again, you had to know some bit about New York Declaration on Forests. If you knew it, then by the process of logical analysis of the options, you could reach the answer rather easily. Moving on to the next question. Magnetite particles suspected to cause neurodegenerative problems are generated as environmental pollutants from which of the following? So, which of the following processes end up generating magnetite particles? Now, what is magnetite? Magnetite is a kind of iron ore. Now, iron ore, I hope that you are aware, has got four such important ores. One is magnetite, hematite, limonite, and siderite. Magnetite is the purest form of iron ore with more than 70% of iron being present in that ore. So which of these activities end up producing magnetite? Now if you take a look at them, brakes of motor vehicles, engines of motor vehicles, microwave stoves within homes, power plants and telephone lines. Now just apply your normal common sense. You are not expected to know that which all activities produce magnetite or what all other byproducts are produced in activities. But think about it. Can a microwave stove in your house or a microwave oven end up producing a kind of an iron ore? Or can the telephone lines end up generating iron ore? Absolutely not. So here you will find automatically that 3 and 5 are incorrect. Now eliminate option 5 and 3 from all the given options. You will be able to eliminate option 1 or A. You will be able to eliminate C. You will be able to eliminate D as well. So automatically you shall be left with option B that is 1, 2 and 4. So these are the questions where you are not expected to know the answer per se, but you are expected to apply your brain and reach at the logical conclusion. So brakes of motor vehicles, they are many of the times made up of certain steel particles, iron, etc. And they end up generating magnetite particles as a result of constant abrasion. So here the answer shall be B, 1, 2 and 4 only. Now moving on to the next question. Which of the following is a filter feeder? Now what is a filter feeder? Filter feeder are basically those kinds of organisms which are found in marine environment where let's say this is the water body. In that water body you have many dissolved components, many suspended particles which are prevalent in that region. Now filter feeders are those who extract these suspended materials, suspended particles and consume them. And that forms the part of their diet. Now if you consider all of these given options, catfish, octopus, oyster or pelicans, most of them or other than oyster, all of them, they consume large food particles. Just to put it very simply, okay. So, it is only oysters which specialize in separating and extracting these suspended particles and feeding themselves. So in this, the correct option shall be C, that is oysters. Now after this, moving on to the next question. Now this question in itself can also be put from moderately difficult to a difficult category because many of the candidates, they are not aware of what filter feeders are. So these are the ones which filter out the water. You have certain kinds of whales as well. They have a very large mouth and from that, they end up separating these suspended particles. So very few organisms, they can be categorized into the portion of filter feeders. So here the answer is C that is oysters. Now, 
the next one. In case of which one of the following biogeochemical cycles, the weathering of rocks is the main source of release of nutrients to enter the cycle. So biogeochemical cycles are the ones where you have the complete process of recycling taking place. So here if you look at it, carbon cycle. Now carbon cycle, it is generated by the gaseous presence of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, etc. and also absorption of it in the region of oceans, forests, etc. So that is how you have a natural recharge. So carbon cycle is going to be incorrect. Similar is the case with nitrogen cycle as well. You have nitrogen fixation which is needed for the nitrogen to be fixated in the soil. But when you consider phosphorus cycle, majority of the phosphorus deposits across the globe you will find that these phosphorus deposits have been a result of the weathering of the various phosphates which are present in the rocks in varying quantities. So all the various large phosphorus mines, they are restricted to those areas where you do have the presence of phosphates in the rock structure and where the phosphates have been actually segregated as a process of natural weathering. So the correct option in this case shall be C, that is phosphorus cycle. Now after this, moving on to the next question. But here again, this was very much in use in the current affairs cycle because of the requirement of phosphorus and suddenly in the first part of this year, the world was staring at a phosphorus car city and the price started rising up. So that is why it was again in the current affairs news cycle. Now, Moving on to the next question. Which of the following are detritivorous? Those organisms which feed on the dead and decomposing material. So out of these, if you look at it, earthworms, jellyfish, millipedes, seahorses and wood lice. Out of these, if you look at it, jellyfish, they do not com actually consume dead and decomposing materials. Many of the times, they actually consume smaller species, smaller marine organisms themselves. So here, two will be incorrect. Now, why I am following this method? Because many of the times as candidates, we are not aware about, let's say, the properties of wood lice or the properties of millipedes, etc. So wherever you are sure, attack that portion first. So eliminate option two. Eliminate two wherever it has been given you will end up eliminating three of the options. If you look at it, even seahorses, they do not consume or they are not under the part of detritivorous. So here again, the answer shall be 1, 3 and 5 only. That is earthworms, millipedes and wood lice. They in fact help in rather a quick decomposition of organic matter which is found in the soil regions across the various parts of the surface, okay? Now, this was again another question which could be solved by logical analysis and elimination. Then, moving on to the next question. The common carbon metric supported by UNEP or UNEP has been or had been developed for A, assessing the carbon footprint of building operations around the world, B, enabling commercial farming entities around the world to enter carbon emission trading, C, enabling governments to assess the overall carbon footprint caused by their countries, and D, assessing the overall carbon footprint caused by the use of fossil fuels by the world in a unit time. So out of these, the common carbon metric is actually used as measurement of carbon footprint which is actually created by the various different buildings across the world because the construction of their buildings and also various different unscientific kinds of construction and designs have used led to a increased carbon footprint in many parts of the world especially in the developing regions now this has become one of the major contributors of an ever expanding carbon footprint so here the first statement is actually correct. 
This is a very factual question, which you can categorize as a difficult question. If you were aware of this, you could get this correct. If you were not aware of this, chances are that you can also end up making a mistake and thereby avoiding yourself a negative marks. So again, this was a question which if you didn't know, it was advisable that you should not have attempted that. Okay. Now, the next question. Which of the following have species that can establish symbiotic relationship with other organisms? So first is cnidarians. So amongst cnidarians, we know that corals, they form a part of cnidarians. So in the case of corals, we know that you have a symbiotic relationship with an algae, that is zooxanthellae, which provides the corals a vivid colored pattern and also a continuous supply of food. So cnidarians are correct. Then you have fungi. So fungi and algae, they oftentimes, they get into a symbiotic relationship and you have the existence of lichens. So this is also a correct one. So both one and two are actually correct. Then you have protozoa. Now protozoa is also one which can enter a symbiotic relationship. You have many different protozoan species which reside in our human body itself. You can take the case of Leishmania. So like this, you have multiple such protozoan species. And in fact, many of the drugs or the treatment pharmaceuticals, they actually capitalize on increasing the strength of these protozoans. So here, all the three, they can actually en enter into a symbiotic relationship with other organisms. So here the answer shall be D, that is one, two, and three. Okay? Now, after that, another question which was rather factual. So R2 code of practices constitutes a tool available for the adoption of. Now, R2 code of practices is basically for the recycling process. Now, in the case of recycling, generally we come across R3, right? Reuse, recycle, etc. So here, R2 is a derivative of that. So R2 is a practice which is initiated by SERI, that is Sustainable Electronic Recycling International, which takes care of electronic recycling so that the electronic wastes which are forming the major headache moving on into the 21st century, these electronic wastes are catered to properly and responsibly so. So if you take a look at the options, the first statement, environmentally responsible practices in electronics recycling industry. So this in itself is the correct statement. But again, granted that if you are, let's say, a candidate who has not heard of R3 practice of recycling or even what SERI is, then this can easily be categorized into a difficult part because it is very factual. And SERI is not that well known of an organization as well. Okay, so here the answer is A. Now, moving on to the next question. Why is there a concern about copper smelting plants? Now, copper smelting plants oftentimes have been cited as one of the main causes of all types of pollution. They lead to land pollution, land degradation in a way, because many of the heavy elements, they actually end up leaching through the soil. They make the soil so predominant of a particular kind of a mineral that the soil productivity gets hampered. And also, during the smelting process, there are various different kinds of poisonous gases which are emitted at the same time. So you have the various gases such as carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, all of them which worsen the air quality but also lead to an increased greenhouse gases concentration into the atmosphere that is caused by these copper smelting plants. And as you would have observed that there has been a closure and multiple closures of copper smelting plants even in our country. 
So that is why this question has been asked. First, they may release lethal quantities of carbon monoxide into the environment. This is correct. Second, copper slag can cause the leaching of some heavy metals into the environment. So what is copper slag? So when you melt the copper, then you have certain impurities that start floating on top. So those impurities are removed from the final output, from the final product. So that is what is slag. So oftentimes when it is actually emitted or when it is given out into the environment, that leads to soil pollution and soil degradation. So the second statement is also correct. Third, they may release sulfur dioxide as a pollutant. This is again correct. So it is one of the major sources of pollution. So in this you will observe 1, 2 and 3, all three of them are the correct statements. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. With reference to furnace oil, consider the following statements. Now furnace oil is also an oil which is considered to be a fuel oil. Now, it is basically produced in one of the final stages of fractional distillation, which is observed when you distillate or when you purify or refine crude oil. So it is very heavy. It is a heavy oil. Many of the times it is used as a lubricant in giant machines. And that is an oil which doesn't have much of its use, but Nowadays, with the development of technology, it is being used in many different areas. So if you look at it, it is a product of oil refineries. This is a correct statement. The second one, some industries use it to generate power. So even though this fuel oil or furnace oil doesn't have a very high amount of calorific value, that is, it doesn't produce huge amount of energy, but still, it is used significantly to produce power and generate electricity in many parts of the globe. So this is also correct. The third, it uses or its use causes sulfur emissions into environment. So because it is a heavy oil, when this oil undergoes combustion, the pollutants are also manifold. And sulfur emission is one of the main stays of emissions when it comes to burning or combustion of crude oil. So this is also a correct statement. So here you have 1, 2 and 3 as the correct or option D, which is the correct option. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. What is blue carbon? Now blue carbon has been in much news significant amount of news in recent times because of the fact that the whole global warming has been in such a new cycle and the fact that absorption of carbon by these oceans have become a major talking point. Because if the carbon emissions across the atmosphere increase from a certain threshold, then naturally the oceans shall end up turning out to be carbon emitters. So in that aspect, and the aspect and the fact that the oceans across the world, under normal and general circumstances, they end up absorbing close to around 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere. That is why blue carbon has been in the news cycles. And recent IPCC reports have further highlighted the role of blue carbon. So, what is blue carbon? Carbon captured by oceans and coastal ecosystems. That is the first option. This in itself is the correct answer. If you look at the other ones, carbon sequestered in forest biomass and agricultural soils, obviously that will not form the blue part. So the blue portion in the blue carbon is a very simple hint for all the candidates. So this can again be categorized into very easy category of question. Now, after this, moving on to the last question. In the nature, which of the following is or are most likely 
to be found surviving on a surface without soil. Now here, if you take a look at it, fern, lichen, moss and mushroom. So if you ideally take a look at it, then all four of them can actually survive without soil. But then, here the twist in the question is, in the nature, that is naturally occurring. So you would have found that ferns, mosses and also mushrooms, these are the ones which can grow on any kind of surface. You can have the growth of ferns and mosses in very high altitude rocky areas as well. And in these areas, the substrate is not soil. These are hard rounded rocks. Mushrooms, oftentimes you can find them to be growing on the rock crevices, on the portions of the tree branches, etc. So that is where you will have ferns, moss, mushrooms, all of them can grow. In some portions, lichens, they can grow in certain areas, but if you take a due notice to that, then lichens do need some thin amount of availability of soil in order to survive and thrive. Ideally, if the option should, would have been 1, 2, 3 and 4, you could have done that. But amongst the given options, the most suitable one is option D, that is 1, 3 and 4. And that is because lichens in general, they can grow but they cannot survive for long without the presence of soil. Now this was brought into focus recently when Uttarakhand declared a lichen park because you have so many species growing in such areas. So here you can get the answer to be 1, 3 and 4 only. Okay. So that concludes the questions from environment and geography. In combination, you could find a total of around 28 questions appearing from this. While environment can be placed into a moderate to slightly difficult category because of certain factual questions which arrived, geography is very much in the easy to moderate. So if you have been covering the basic books and the basic materials, you could have easily got at least 20 out of these 28 to be correct. 20 to 22 could have been the correct attempt. Okay? So that shall be all from my side. Now I shall be handling over the podium to Rashesh sir to take over the discussion for science and technology. Thank you. Good evening everyone, let us look at the portion of science and technology and have a look at all the questions that have been asked today's, in the today's examination. Now the first question that we have is water can dissolve more substances than any other liquid because A it is dipolar in nature, B it is a good conductor of heat, C it has high value of specific heat and D it is an oxide of hydrogen. Now the main reason why water can dissolve more substances or in other words it is also called as a universal solvent. Many a times this is a term that is used for water, universal solvent. And why it is called as universal solvent mainly is that it is actually bipolar or dipolar in nature. Meaning that if you look at the structure of water, you will see that something like this can be observed. That you will see that if this is the structure, we also send, say that this is a bent shape and 
this kind of small charge can be seen on hydrogen and small negative charge can be seen on oxygen. So, because of that we see that there is this kind of structure and this kind of a structure a dipolar structure makes it a very good solvent. Because of this what happens is a lot of polar solvents and a lot of ionic compounds they can very easily gel in with water and that is why water can become a very good solvent for all these substances. The only substances that cannot actually dissolve in water would be the substances which are non-polar, all right, which are non-polar and that is why sometimes we say that saying this is a universal solvent is not entirely correct because if you go to substances which are non-polar in nature like the fats or oils etc., they do not uh, do dissolve in water. So, that is why perhaps we should not call it as universal solvent, but the main reason why it can dissolve more substances than any other liquid is mainly because of its dipolar nature. So, that is why the correct answer here will be A. Moving on to the second question, second question is with reference to street lighting, note this street lighting, how do sodium lamps differ from LED lamps? Statement 1, sodium lamps produce light in 360 degrees, but it is not so in the case of LED lamps. Now, when we talk about the first statement, sodium lamps produce light in 360 degrees, which is not the case in LED lamps. This is one of the e examples of advantage that you have with LED lamps. That when we talk about sodium lamps, sodium lamps are said to be omnidirectional. Right? They are said to be omnidirectional and because of this very nature of them being omnidirectional, this is the reason why they also waste a lot of energy. Their efficiency is low because of this particular reason and that is why when we look at LED which is not omnidirectional, which basically produces light in 180 degrees, that is why the light, the illumination with LED is much better and that is why it is much focused in nature. So, that is why statement number 1 that sodium lamps produce light in 360 degrees, but it is not so the case in, in the case of LED lamps, this is correct. So, statement 1 is correct. Now, statement 2, as street light, sodium lamps have longer span than LEDs, this is completely wrong, because what happens with sodium lamps is that normally you would see that their entire life span would perhaps be in the range of 5000 to 15000 hours, all right. 5000 to 15000 hours in case of sodium lamps, but in case of LED lamps it can be as high as 1 lakh hours, it can be as high as 1 lakh hours and that is the reason why LED lamps are actually preferred, because the lifespan is high. Why is the lifespan high? Mainly because they do not waste any energy, there is no heating up or cooling down time that they need, but you might have seen sodium lamps as all the street lights, you might see that it takes some time for them to heat up and then they start lighting properly. That is not the case with LEDs. You will see that LED lamps will be able to do that very quickly. So, that is why this is a wrong statement. Now, on this basis itself, if you look at the options, 2 only cannot be correct, right? 1, 2 and 3 cannot be correct because 2 is wrong. 1 is definitely correct, so only option that we are left with is C. So, even if you do not know statement number 3, if you do not know about it, it is still fine. The spectrum of visible light from sodium lamps is almost monochromatic, which is true and while LED lamps offer significant color advantages in street lighting and this is one of the advantages again that LEDs have over sodium lamps. So, that is why or any metal halide lamps for example. So, that is why we can say that this is also a correct statement. So, statement 3 is correct. The only thing that could have been different in this question is if it was not about only street lighting. Then in that case sodium lamps produce 360 degrees, but not that is not so in the case of LED lamps would have been wrong, because there are certain LED filament lamps where you would see that it can also be omnidirectional. So, then it would have been wrong, but in case of street lighting this is the correct statement. So, that is why correct statement here correct answer will be C. Then question number 3, the term ACE2 is talked about in the context of and this is something that has been in the news because of COVID-19 that ACE2 basically are receptors and last year they were in news. When we were looking at the different ways in which we can try to make the vaccines for COVID-19 and how can we cure COVID-19, when the early researches were happening, one of the things that they saw was that these ACE2 receptors, they are the ones where the virus was going and attaching itself to. 
and these ACE2 receptors are a very important part of the surface of many cells. For example, cells of the heart, cells of lungs, significantly in lungs they are found. So that's why when the virus is going and attacking these cells or these receptors on the surface of these cells, it makes it easy for them to bind to all these cells. So that's why COVID-19, with COVID-19 we saw that the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus was actually attacking the ACE2 receptor. It was going and attaching itself to the ACE2 receptor. So that's why now if you look at the options, genes introduced in the genetically modified plants, nothing to do with Development of India's own satellite navigation system, nothing to do with satellite navigation. Radio callers for lifetime, uh, li wildlife tracking cannot be correct. So spread of viral diseases. This is going to be the most appropriate answer in this particular question. Moving to question number four, bisphenol A, a cause of concern, is a structural or a key component in the manufacture of which of the following kinds of plastic. Now bisphenol A has been in news for quite some time. It's not only about this year or last year, but it has been in use for quite some time because bisphenol A is mainly used in producing polycarbonate plastics. You can see this option as well. It is used in polycarbonate plastics. At the same time, they have very harmful effects on humans. For example, in the adults, it may not have a lot of proven problems, but in the infants, in the children, it can have some issues. It can cause issues with the brain of children and that's why this is something that was supposed to be restricted in use because these polycarbonate bottles that we have these polycarbonate bottles are also used as bottles for milk of uh, to provide milk to children so that's why we know that polycarbonate uses bisphenol a and this bisphenol a can cause some issues in infants and children and that's why it has been in use that we wanted to ban the use of bisphenol a altogether in the manufacturing units of polycarbonate. So that's why the correct answer here will be B. Then question number 5. Triclosan considered harmful when exposed to higher levels for a long time. Exposed to high levels for a long time is most likely present in which of the following. Now triclosan you might have come across this term if you have looked into the manufacturing of hand sanitizers and what hand sanitizers have. So many of the hand sanitizers, many of the soaps, soaps etc, they are all using triclosan. Now triclosan although is being used in very small amounts in all these things, but if it is used in higher amounts or if you intake or if your intake is in very high amounts, then in that case it can be very harmful. So that's why if you look at the options that have been given, food preservatives, fruit ripening substances, reuse plastic containers, this is basically about bisphenol and D is toiletries. So that's why the correct answer will be toiletries. So here triclosan, one of the things that was being told about triclosan is, although not proven yet, it was said that it can be an agent causing uh, colon cancer. It can be in a very lo long time if you are exposed to it for a very long time and you are using it for in very high dosages or in very high amounts then only it can cause these kind of problems but again hasn't been proven yet. Then question number 6, which one of the following is a reason why astronomical distances are measured in light years? All right, What is a light year? A light year is the distance that is travelled by light in one year, that is one light year. Now why do we use light years instead of kilometres, miles etc? First of all light year is a very big unit and normally you are looking at very big distances when it comes to all the celestial bodies and the measurement of distances between celestial bodies. So that is one of the reasons why astronomical distances are measured in light years. Let, let's look at the options. Distance among stellar bodies do not change. That's not true. We know that the universe is expanding and with the expansion of the universe, the distances between the stellar objects actually also keep on increasing. So that's why this cannot be the correct answer. B is gravity of stellar bodies do not change. It can change. We know when you talk about gravity of any substance or any celestial body, you know that gravity will always be affected by the mass. So if I know that certain mass can be ejected out of the stellar objects, then of course the mass will decrease and if the mass decreases, gravity also decreases. So that's why it cannot remain unchanged. Light always travels in straight line. This is also not correct because when you talk about certain phenomena, like for example if you talk about gravitational lensing, again gravitational lensing has been in use. 
So, in case of gravitational lensing what happens? In case of gravitational lensing we know that bending of light happens across a very massive object or massive celestial body. So, bending of light is possible and anyway according to wave physics we know that bending of light is possible. So, that is why light always travels in straight line is also not correct. The only option that can be a correct option is speed of light is always the same and this is the primary reason why we want to use light because light being an electromagnetic wave the speed of light does not change according to the medium. Whether you are in a solid medium, a liquid medium, a gaseous medium or even in vacuum the speed of light does not change at all. So, that is why you can very safely mark the option as D. So, that is why correct option for question 6 will be D. Looking at question number 7, with reference to recent developments regarding recombinant vector vaccines, recombinant vector vaccines, consider the following statements. Statement 1, genetic engineering is applied in the development of vaccines. Statement 2, vac bacteria and viruses are used as vectors. Now, when we talk about genetic engineering, here the first word itself says recombinant, right? So, there could be native vectors and there could be recombinant vectors. So, here recombinant vectors simply means that there is genetic engineering being used. So, that is why statement 1 is anyway correct. Statement 2 is bacteria and viruses are used as vectors. Now, here viruses for sure are being used, right? So, many a times recombinant vector, uh, vector vaccines are also called as viral vector vaccines or viral recombinant vector vaccines. So, we know that viruses are used for sure. Can bacteria be used? The answer is yes. Even bacteria can be used and bacteria can be used as DNA carriers. They can be used as DNA, DNA carriers. So, DNA can be inserted inside the bacteria and this bacteria can be delivered into the body or into the human body and as soon as the bacteria is inserted into the human body, it will invoke the immune response from the body. So, that is why bacteria and viruses both can be used. Usually in most of the cases we see that only viruses are used, but we can also use bacteria in this case. So, that is why this could have been a little confusing question, but the answer to this will be both 1 and 2 that is C. Then moving on to the next question, in the co context of hereditary diseases, Consider the following statements. One, passing on mitochondrial diseases from parent to child can be prevented by mitochondrial replacement therapy either before or after in vitro fertilization of eggs. So, mitochondrial replacement therapy, yes, it can be used and it is being used to uh, treat any kind of mitochondrial diseases that can be passed on to the children. So, that is why statement one is correct. Statement 2 is a child inherits mitochondrial diseases entirely from mother and not from father. Entirely from mother and not from father. Now, when we look at bacteria, uh, when we look at the concept of mitochondrial diseases, you might have come across the term three parent baby and there we discuss that in three parent baby concept. What happens is that, that the mitochondria, the defective mitochondria from the mother is taken away and it is replaced with the mitochondria of a donor, correct? because there was mitochondrial disease in the mother. Now, what happens is when the fertilization happens between uh, the egg and the sperm cells, in this case we always see that the mitochondria is transferred from the mother to the child. Now, there have been very small number of cases where we have seen that actually mitochondria also was patrilineal. It was not matrilineal in, in one or two cases. There have been one or two reported cases there. But they have only been the cases about transfer of mitochondria. We have not documented any case where mitochondrial disease has been transferred. So, if the question was a child inherits mitochondria from entirely from mother and not from father, then in that case we could have marked this option as wrong if it was only about mitochondria. But here you are talking about mitochondrial disease. So, in cases that we have seen, even, even if we have seen the cases of mitochondria being transferred, we have not seen any case of mitochondrial disease being transferred. So, that is why statement 2 is also correct that a child inherits mitochondrial disease entirely from mother and not from father. So, that is why both the statements that have been given here are also correct. So, question number 8, the correct answer is C. Then coming to question number 9, very straightforward direct question, ball guard 1 and ball guard 2 technologies are mentioned in the context of both of them basically are BT cotton. 
the first BT cotton that we had was Bolgard 1 and then an improved version of BT cotton was prepared and this was Bolgard 2. So look at the options, clonal propagation of crop plants, development, developing genetically modified crop plants, this looks correct, Pro production of plant growth substances and production of biofertilizers. So that is why correct answer here will be B, a very straightforward question. Question number 10 and this perhaps is one of the trickiest questions that have come here. Let us have a discussion on this. In a pressure cooker, the temperature at which the food is cooked, the temperature at which the food is cooked depends mainly upon which of the following. Area of hole in the lid, temperature of the flame, weight of the lid. Now first of all, when we talk about the lid, there are two options related to the lid. Area of hole in the lid. So what happens with increasing or decreasing the area of the lid? If you increase the area, what happens inside the pressure cooker? First of all, what happens inside the pressure cooker? The pressure builds up right? and pressure is high and that is why uh, the boiling point of water also rises and more heat can be contained inside pressure cooker. That is why you will be able to cook food very easily and fast inside the pressure cooker. Correct. Now what happens here? If you increase the area of the hole in the lead, then what happens? The pressure that is contained inside the pressure cooker that can be released easily if the area of the lid is high or the area is large, pressure can be released very easily and that is why temperature will drastically drop down. So that is why the temperature at which the food is being cooked will depend on this particular factor. So one is definitely correct, alright. Then comes two, temperature of the flame. This is a tricky part because when we talk about temperature of the flame, what happens is temperature is an external factor. What happens with the flame? Let us say there are two possibilities, right? Either you will cook at low flame or you will cook at high flame. You will either cook at low flame or you will cook at high flame. So in both the cases, what happens is that the temperature that is being raised or the temperature that we are gaining inside the pressure cooker, there is a limit to it because as soon as the pressures increase, the temperatures increase, the whistle will go off. Correct? And that will decrease the pressure inside the pressure cooker and ultimately the amount of heat that is contained inside the pressure cooker will remain constant. So that is why even if you increase the temperature of the flame, the only thing that will happen is the state that you needed to reach, the state will be reached faster. That is the only thing that will happen because as soon as the amount of heat starts to increase inside uh, the pressure cooker, automatically the whistle goes off and the pressure is again contained. So even if the temperature of the flame is high, that is if you are cooking at high flame instead of low flame, even in that case there will be no difference as such in the temperature at which the food is being cooked. So that is the main reason why I would say that this is wrong, that the temperature at which the food is being cooked will not have an issue with the external factor that is temperature of the flame. If let us say it was about the time that it takes to cook the food, then in that case this could have been a tricky situation because time will reduce if you increase the flame, correct? So that is why statement number 2 I would say is wrong. Then statement number 3, anywhere you do not need statement number 3 because 1 is correct, so you are left with this, this and this, 2 is wrong, so that is why this cannot be the answer, this cannot be the answer, this cannot be the answer, we are anyway left with only 1 and 3. But anyway look at the third statement, third statement says weight of the lead. So weight of the lead, as you increase the weight of the lid, the pressure will increase, the pressure build up inside will increase and that is why it will become a factor, alright. So that is why temperature will with increase in uh, pressure, it will also affect the temperature and that is why it will be a factor. So that is why the correct answer will be 1 and 3. So this I would say was one of the most difficult questions to answer in this area if I mean the if you go according to the factors and look at all the factors and how exactly they will have an effect here. Looking at question number 11, consider the following bacteria, fungi and virus, which of the above can be cultured in artificial or synthetic medium. Now this is about virus basically, because when we talk about virus, virus needs a living host. Virus needs a living host for it to be cultured properly. So that is why virus cannot be cultured in artificial or synthetic medium. So that is why 3 cannot be correct. So if 3 cannot be correct, B cannot be the answer, C cannot be the answer and D cannot be the answer. So that is why the correct answer will be 1 and 2 only. So that is why I mean these are the kinds of things I was telling in the previous sessions also that always look at the options that it will help you eliminate many of the wrong answers. So because viruses need living host for their uh, 
to for their culture to be prepared that's why we cannot say that virus can be cultured in synthetic or artificial medium apart from there are certain techniques like lichens etc but that's not true that cannot be considered here then consider the following statements adenovirus have single stranded dna genome whereas retrovirus have double stranded dna uh, genome first of all adenovirus do not have single stranded but they have double stranded dna genome and when we talk about retrovirus retrovirus anyway do not have double stranded dna genomes they have rna so this is not correct so statement 1 cannot be correct so one this is gone this is gone statement number 2 common cold is sometimes caused by adenovirus whereas aids is caused by a retrovirus this is true because when you talk about hiv hiv is a retrovirus and common cold fever there are many of these common diseases like diarrhea etc also all these are caused by adenovirus so that's why statement number 2 given here is correct so our correct answer will be b that is 2 only moving on to question number 13 which of the following is used in preparing a natural natural mosquito repellent and you might know this if you have done a little research you might know that lemon grass is what is used as natural mosquito repellent because lemon grass for example even if you go to amazon or flipkart or any of these websites you might any of these websites you might see that there are many companies which are advertising their natural mosquito repellents where they are using lemon grass so that's why lemon grass is very very important in this context all right so these were the questions that have been asked in the section of science and technology i would say that the entire section of science and technology was at a medium level because there were some questions which are direct facts and there are some very important difficult concepts that have been asked so because of that two or three questions become difficult otherwise questions as you can see viruses questions have been asked uh questions have been asked on vaccine so because of all those areas related to covid there are three questions that have been asked out of 13 so that's why some of these areas make it a little easy for the question paper to be solved but overall because of this balance i would say that this was a medium level question paper uh for you all right so next up we have ancient history section that will be taken over by abhishek sir so i will be handing over the session to abhishek sir thank you
going to deal with questions which were coming from ancient medieval art and culture. Generally, when we talk about these questions, they were quite tricky and quiz questions came about. So let's look at this section and then we'll do the analysis in the end. The first question is, which one of the following ancient towns is well known for its elaborate system of water harvesting and management by building a series of dams and channelizing water into connected reservoirs. So when we talk about this is a very easy question. This was technically the easiest question which could come about because we all know the answer here is Dholavira. Dholavira was in the news also and generally it is considered a very, very important site when we talk about water harvesting. Kalibangan is known for fire altars. We know that Rakhigadi, over and above that, it is known for the plowed field. And Roper is a very big and important urban center in Harappa. So this would be the easiest question and this you should attempt irrespective of anything. When we talk about question number two, now this is a very tricky question, very tough. And this can only be done with a good understanding of generally early medieval history. And over and above that, you need to understand the time period in which this question is being asked. So this question can either be attempted or not attempted only based on understanding. I'll tell you how you can approach this question. There are two ways you can do it. So from the decline of the Guptas, which is 467 and 467 CE, until the rise of Harshwardhan, which is 606 CE, in the, uh, in the early 7th century, which one of the following kingdoms were holding power in northern India? So first you need to know these two dates, irrespective of anything, 467 and 606. Then only you know that there's a difference in what time period we're talking about. So first, the Guptas of Magad, the Paramaras of Malwa, the Pushyabhutis of Thanesar, the Mokha, uh, Mokharis of Kannauj, the Yadavas of Devgiri, and the metrikas of Alabi. Now, this question can be done two ways. First question, first way is that you can understand that obviously, if the Guptas are going to decline, there will be a smaller but much more localized Magad based Gupta dynasty, meaning that you don't have dynasties which disappear one day, but there is a gradual process. So, one should be there in the answer. Over and above that, when we talk about Harshvardhan, Harshvardhan actually comes under the Pushyabhuti dynasty in Thanesar. We discussed this in class also. So technically, there needs to be one and three together. And there is technically only one option in which one and three appear together, thereby making B the answer. However, the other way of doing this question is to know the dates, wherein you need to know that the Paramaras of Malwa are technically 9th to uh, close to 13th century when we talk about the Rashkutas, then we need to know that the Yadavas of Devgiri were actually quite late 11th century and this was 550 CE and this was 475 CE, their starting dates. But I don't expect you to. The point of the matter is this question is a quiz question. If you can get it, good, but you are, you have to have a lot of caution when you're actually attempting this question because there's a lot of dates which are being played and early medieval is generally a topic which needs to be done with a lot of understanding. Then we go to question number three. Again, a very, very tough question because this is not expected from UPSC because it's asking a question on Mitakshara law, which is the basis of Hindu law itself, but then on the mechanics of it and the subsets. So with reference to the history of ancient India, which one of the following statements is correct? Mitakshara was the civil law for upper caste and Dayabhaga was a civil law for lower caste. In the Mitakshara system, the son can claim right over property during the lifetime of the father, whereas the Dayabhaga system, it is only after the death of the father that the son can claim right over property. The Mitakshara system deals with the, ma which, uh, with the matters related to property held by male members only of a family, whereas the Dayabhaga system deals with matter related to property held by both male and female members of the family. Now, this is a very wordy question, very long question. And the whole point is, this is based on understanding. Now, the point is, the first statement is totally incorrect because Mitakshara laws and Dayabhaga are not too different on for upper caste and lower caste. It's technically a geographical distinction. Mitakshara law is for all over India. However, Assam and West Bengal does not come in. But Dayabhaga, which is technically a subset or a sub-school of Mitakshara, is there specifically for Assam and West Bengal. So this is totally an incorrect statement. So if that you knew, somehow you knew, then automatically either two will be correct or three will be correct. 
So let's now look at the patriarchal society which was there generally in ancient and medieval India. You would realize that the word female member automatically should disqualify this option, thereby making two only the answer. But the point of the matter is this is again a very, very tough question. So in ancient, we had two very, very tough questions and one easy. Again, in the examination, if you have attempted them, well and good. But I would say that these questions again should have been done with a lot of caution and they, there was a need for understanding. Then we go to medieval. Medieval, again the same story, two very important, two very tough questions. One an easy question. With reference to medieval India, which one of the following is the current sequ sequence, correct sequence in ascending order in terms of size? Now the point is here ascending word is very, very important because this is a question which is coming from Mughal, Mughal administration. Over and above that, over and above that, you need to also understand one important thing, which is that the, the Mughal administration is a very, very important topic. But here ascending word is important. So Mughal administration and its subas. So here, if you knew that what is the way the whole dynasty is divided, so it is first suba, then sarkar, and then pargana. Pargana is a number of villages. When one number of villages come together, there is a pargana. Then there is a lot of parganas come together to make a sarkar, and four to five sarkars make a suba. So if you saw it as a descending, you would have marked C. But the answer here is A, which is Pargana, Sarkar, Suba, because they are asking it on the basis of ascending order. This is the easy question which came or you would say moderate because we do it in class, we do it in a lot of platforms. The point of the matter is this is the easier one. Now, now comes the most difficult. Out of all questions which came in history, this was the most difficult question because of the fact that this was a very random question which the UPSC asked and technically this should have been left alone. According to the Portuguese writer Nunes, the women in Vijayanagara Empire were experts in which of the following areas? Wrestling, astrology, accounting, soothsaying. Soothsaying is about telling your future. Now the point here is as this question is technically based on a very old article about alpha women in Hampi which came close to 2012, 2013. They've actually picked up that article. But the point is here the answer is D. Yes, they were known to have the following occupations from wrestling, astrology or uh, accounting, even soothsaying. But the point of the matter is I don't expect you to know this question. I don't expect you to know this question because you will never read the translation of Nunes itself. It is based on an article which is very, very old and over and above that this is a lacuna area, very, uh, uh, area in which you would rather not go into. So this is the most difficult question out of all which is a random quiz question which came in the examination. The last question, this is a moderately difficult question from medieval and this can only be done with understanding. That is why we always emphasize in class that nowadays UPSC is moving towards conceptual questions as well. So consider the following statements. It was during the reign of Iltutmish that Chengiz Khan reached the Indus in pursuit of the fugitive Khwarizma prince. It was during the raid of Muhammad bin Tughlaq that Taimur occupied Multan and crossed the Indus. And it was during the reign of Devraya II of Vijayanagara Empire that Vasco da Gama reached the coast of Kerala. Now here again the point of the matter is very very simple that you need to know how these are placed with each other. So the first statement is totally correct. Yes, Iltutmish did not allow Alauddin Muhammad who was the Khawarizmi prince wanted to come into India. He did not give refuge thereby making sure that in Changez Khan would never cross Indus thereby protecting India. Thereafter Halaku and you have other Mongols which will also uh, technically pose a lot of problem. But this is a totally correct statement. Now the point is Taimur. When did Taimur come to India? 1398 and technically it would, could, cannot be Muhammad bin Tughlaq because Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign was in, over by 1351. It is technically Mahmud Tughlaq. So they are pay, playing with the name. They are playing with the name. So this is the incorrect. So if this is incorrect, this is incorrect. Now either 1 could be correct or 3 could be correct. We already know that 1 is correct. But 3 is incorrect because of the fact that Vasco de Gama came in 1498 
and Devraya's reign was already over by 1446. So this is a, a totally incorrect statement. Again, a question which needs a lot of understanding. A lot of understanding because at the end of the day, you can't do this question without understanding the time periods. And over and above that, they're playing with the names also. So one was correct. You could have only two options, thereby actually removing three itself also. So that was the other way of approaching this question. But you needed to know that if two was correct or not. So irrespective of elimination, which can be used, the point of the matter is would two work or not? And that is fully based on understanding. Now let's move to art and culture. Again, as I said, three questions, three questions, two very tough questions. Here again, in medieval, two que tough questions and one moderately tough question. Art and culture again saw this kind of a trend. So history as such came quite a, a peculiar stance which the UPSC took, where they are now moving away from very standard good questions to some form of quiz questions. So with reference to India, the term halbi ho kui pertains to. Now, this is a question where in art and culture comes in as current affairs. So this is a current affairs question wherein you had a Chhattisgarh rapper who actually does a halbi rap. So this was in the news in February of 2021 where in the Maoist belt in the red area itself, he is known to rap in Chhattisgarh in halbi which is a regional tribal language. So here again, the other way of getting this to, to this answer is you do dance forms. We do that in class. So you know that halbi or ho or kui is not actually any form of dance. Musical instruments, the same story. Over and above that, prehistoric cave arts, we also we only do Bhim Betka or Lakhudiyar, which is very, very known. But over and above, this question can only be done, can only be done if you knew the current affairs part. So this would be a moderately difficult to a difficult question because again, it needs a lot of understanding, but you could use your residual or knowledge base to come to this answer. Then, with reference to the history of ancient India, Bhavabhuti, Hastimala, Shameshwara were, Shameshwara were famous Jain monks, playwrights, temple architects or philosophers. Here again, this is moderately difficult because you would never know who Hastimala is or Shameshwara were. Technically, you would never know. These are two very important play writers and poets of the different eras which comes in 9th and 10th century. But Bhavabhuti is important because Bhavabhuti you would know because he's an 8th century poet who is actually sometimes uh, uh, paralleled to Kalidas. Some people say that he actually wrote as well as Kalidas. So here the answer is B, which is playwriters, because of the fact that Bhavabhuti is a known figure, and we do it in class also, that he was a very, very important poet in Yashovardhan's court. Over and above that, Bhavabhuti is a name which is there in all or standard data. Now the most difficult question of or the randomest question of art and culture, which is which one of the following statement is correct. Now this is a question in which geography plus history a question has come and that is now been put as an art and culture question. Ajanta caves lies in the gorge of Vaghora river. Sachi Stupa lies in the gorge of Chambal river. Uh, Pandulenar caves shrines in the gorge of Narmada river and Amravati Stupa lies in the gorge of Godavari river. Now this question you would not know because of either you don't know where these rivers are or over and above that who which these caves are. Here the answer is actually Ajanta and A because it is a very known fact that Ajanta is based in the caves which are cut by the Vagora river. However, you could come through elimination also. How do you come to elimination? Stupas would never be in a gorge. So gorge as a geographical formation, you would never have stupas. They would be re rather be in a plain area because of their purpose. So these two could be eliminated. When we talk about Pandulena, the point is that Pandulena is actually a subset of the Nasik caves. And if there's a subset of the Nasik cave, it was quite unlikely that they would be on the Narmada river. But the point of the matter is, this is again a very random question, which should have been left in the examination because you don't know the geographical part. But if you do Ajanta with us or in, in standard material, you know that Vaghora river is the gorge in which the Ajanta caves 
वर नाउ क्वेश्चन नंबर फोर अगेन अ डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन बट इट इज अगेन अ करेंट अफेयर क्वेश्चन दे इज अ लॉट ऑफ डिस्कशन नाउट इज अबाउट द पार्लियामेंट बिल्डिंग देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ क्रिटिसिजम ऑल्सो एंड दिस क्वेश्चन देन स्टेम्स फ्रॉम दैट फैक्ट विद रेफरेंस टू दी चौसत योगिनी टेम्पल सिचुएटेड नियर मोरेना कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट इट इज अ सर्क्यूलर टेम्पल बिल्ड ड्यूरिंग द रेड ऑफ द कच कच गा कच कच पघका पघटा डायनेस्टी इट इज द ओनली सर्क्यूलर टेम्पल बिल्ड इन इंडिया it was meant to promote the vaishnav the vaishnav the vaishnavite cult in the region or vaishnava cult in the region it its design has been has given rise to a popular belief that it was the inspiration behind the indian parliament building now here again you don't know this dynasty a very ob obscure dynasty we don't know about kachkach pa ghata dynasty a lot that is why it is quite quite a difficult question because it's a obscure dynasty generally but the point is it says only only the point of the matter is this is true that it is a circular temple and it actually belongs to this dynasty also but it is not the only circular temple because of the fact that there is also another at bhedagat at bhedagat at bhedagat you also have another important circular temple which actually belongs to the yogini cult now the way you could come to the answer is the other way round also the point is it is saying that it is out of the vaishnava cult or vaishnavite cult or vishnu cult but the point here is that the vishnu cult and the yogini cults are different so if you know that three was there you could have got out of that two options one and two only one and four only now you know that one is correct now 2 is incorrect because of the fact it says only and it is not the only one it there you have beta ghat as another yogini temple which is circular and 1 and 4 only is correct so the answer is here is c so it is again a very difficult question because of the context it means it will be actually being asked over and above that yogini cult we don't generally expect in the examination this dynasty is also obscure over and above that the current affairs part is related to the indian parliament building and we generally don't do these things for the preparation so you need to again understand this was a question which could be left alone last question which came from art and culture historical place and well known for Burza home a very important neolithic site not known for rock cut shrines is actually known for pit burials pit burials and pit dwellings it is very very well known burza home is technically an exception in neolithic sites because of the fact that there was a lot of pit dwellings people used to stay under ground so this is totally incorrect so this goes this goes you have three only and two and three only which tells us that at the end of the day three is correct that you have gyaneshwar which is a copper artifacts yes it is a chalcolithic site near the khetri mine so it is correct but you did not need to know that now you need to know if is it two is correct or not and yes chandra khetu ghar is actually known for terracotta art so the answer here is d so before we go into modern india and I hand it over to rohit sir the point of the matter is at the end of the day all 11 questions which came from ancient medieval art and culture were quite difficult over and above that 6 to 7 were out of context random questions so you could either attempt them in the examination or leave them alone but as i told you you can use elimination or other methods but you need to have an understanding a deep understanding of medieval early medieval ancient to come to these answers so i will now hand it over for modern india to rohit sir thank you
Hello everyone. Let us now discuss the questions that came from the section of modern history. Altogether, nine questions came from this particular section. And trust me, they were tough. But of course, the if you divide these questions, three questions could be said to be very easy. Two could be said to be moderately easy to tough. And of course, four were tough. But then, it depends on knowledge. If you know something, you would have given the answer to those questions. Last part of our discussion for today, nine questions, let us discuss them. Let us look at the first question. See, this question says, consider the following statements. Number one, St. Francis Xavier was one of the founding members of Jesuit order. Number two, St. Francis Xavier died in Goa and a church is dedicated to him there. Number three, the feast of St. Francis Xavier is celebrated in Goa each year. Now, if you look at this chapter, this comes from your arrival of Europeans. Now, see, some of you would be knowing about this great man. He came to India in order to promote Catholicism. Now, as we all know, the Portuguese, when they had come to India, or for that matter, any of the Europeans who came to our country, they had come with the objective of God, glory and gold. They wanted to propagate Christianity into this land. So this is correct that this man was one of the founding members of this order. He had been sent for promotion of Christianity. Now number two point. See, this is very tough to know where did he die. Usually we don't focus on this. But the fact of the matter is that we focus here on this issue because he did not die in India. Rather, he died in China. But before he had gone to China, he had expressed the desire that whenever, wherever he dies, he should be buried in Goa only. And that is the reason his supporters, they had brought his embalmed body back to Goa and had reburied it and the church is established here in Goa. So point number two was wrong. Moment two is wrong. The only answer that is correct is C. Now, this question I have put under the tough category because neither Bipin Chandra talks about this nor does Spectrum talk about this but then in the classes we have discussed about St. Francis Xavier and this was a point which was totally and clearly discussed by us in the class. So it depends if you knew about it you would have answered this. Come to question number two. See what they have done. Basically the chapter how the constitution of our country was formed before independence, what all steps were taken. Based on that, two statements have been taken. Government of India Act 1919, that is Montagu Chelmsford reforms, and Government of India Act 1935. Now, in classes, if you would have heard, we have seen in the last one decade, four questions have come from this topic. Two questions in prelims have come from this topic. Always a very, very important topic of our exam. Now look at the first statement. The Montagu Chainsford reforms of 1919 recommended granting voting rights to all the women above the age of 21. Forget everything, just concentrate on this word. If you would have attended our strategy sessions also, we have always recommended to look at words like all, each, everyone and all. Just think about this. 1919, these women were given the right to vote. Do you think at that moment every woman would have been given the right to vote? At a time when voting was related to property rights, in case of women, many people were discussing marital status, education, knowledge. Do you think everybody would be provided? Never. This was totally a wrong statement. The moment one is wrong. Now, look at point number two. The Government of India Act 1935 gave women reserved seats in legislature. Now. This is something, if you would have discussed the round table conferences, in the round table conferences, for example, many women had participated. For example, second round table conference, Sarojini Naidu had gone as a representative of women. Similarly, Jahanara Shahanava, she was one lady who attended all the three round table conferences. In these round table conferences, there were talks with regards to that the fact that the women should be given the uh, seats in legislature. 
that is why some seats were provided and reserved for women and the ethnic groups at this point of time. So few seats were definitely reserved for women. So point number two is correct. So the answer to this question is B, there was some reservation. Now, this particular point, Bipin Chandra has not elaborated in their standard book, but then Spectrum has talked about this. Moving ahead, question number three, the easiest question that you can see here. On 8th August 1942, which great event happened in our country? You can see the Quit India Resolution was adopted by All India Congress Committee. There is simply no doubt. Don't even look at BCD. Just go and tick this. You did not have to think about any other options. A is correct. Apart from if you see, this happened way before 28 months of Congress rule had ended way earlier. So this was totally wrong. Similarly, Viceroy's Executive Council to expand more Indians, this was already done, not on this particular date, it was being done. Crips Mission, they had also come in the month of March only and they had given their uh, recommendations way earlier than this. Don't think about any other things, A is the answer. Easiest question, moving ahead, fourth, now see. Who among the following is associated with songs from prison, a translation of ancient India religious lyrics in English? Now, most of the standard textbooks have not given this particular thing. But look at the options. We can get a lot from option. First of all, look at all these four options. Are all these four people somebody who have gone to jail? Because this has been written. Who among the following have written, you can see, songs from prison. As the name suggests, definitely they would have gone to prison. We know Bal Gangadhar Tilak went to jail for six years, 1908, 1897 event. Jawaharlal Nehru had different stints in jail. Similar goes with Gandhiji. Now, first confusion would be, did Sarojini Naidu go to jail? Yes. During 1932 CDM and 1942 Quit India, both the times she had gone to jail. Second thing is, are all these four people prolific writers? Absolutely. All of them have been writers. They have brought journals, magazines. They have written so much here. So now, apply your other knowledge. For example, if I consider these two people, first of all. Sarojini Naidu, prolific writer. She is known as Nightingale of India. She has written so much, but if you look at her writings, she is more coming from the realm of romanticism. So maybe she would not have done this. Similarly, Jawaharlal Nehru, as far as his writings are concerned, he has kept least, uh, I would say, writings are on the issues of religion. He, he was the son of Motilal Nehru, who was almost an atheist, did not deliberate much or did not give a lot of importance to religion. So again, it seems maybe he wouldn't have written this particular thing. Now comes Bal Ganga Tilak and Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi. See, why both of them? Because Bal Ganga Tilak, he has also written when he was in Burma, when he was in jail. At that moment, he had written a lot. For example, he had written on Bhagavad Gita. So he might have written on something that's religious lyrics. But then, see, the nomenclature, songs from prison. If this name comes, you know, one of the things that comes that maybe this would not have been work of an extremist leader like Bal Ganga Dhatilak. He was almost a neo-revolutionary. He was an extremist. He wouldn't have written something like this. The correct answer to this question is Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi. When he was in Yarwada jail around the time of your uh, CDM, then he had got this Bhajanavali translated, later it was translated into English by a British man. His name was John Holland. He had done overall tough question. I don't say it's very easy to analysis or analyze like this and say later that this could have been correct. This couldn't have been correct. At that moment, it's tough in the examination hall. But then if you see here, Gandhiji thought you know, Yarvada jail, he was in those days in Yarvada jail and he might have, of course, you don't know that when he has written it exactly, 
But then some of you could have gone for this also. But then I admit it's a tough question. I'm not saying it's not. Neither Bipin Chandra nor Spectrum, none of the standard textbooks have mentioned anything about this particular thing. Songs from prison, answer is your C, Mohan Das, Karamchand, Gandhi. Move question number fifth. Now, I put it as an easy question. Socio-religious reform movement, again, year after year is giving us questions. Last year it gave two questions. Vithal Vidvanchak, which was again, just like the last question, it was to be thought like that. And Rakhmai Bai case. This year they have given a very easy question. They are asking who was associated as a secretary with Hindu female school and later came to be known as Bethany female school. The answer is none other than the great Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar who did the maximum with regards to the emancipation of women. The moment he was appointed as the secretary to this particular school around 1850, lots of girls had come for education. They joined these schools and it gave a huge boost to this. And again, directly given in your Bipin Chandra. I have not gone into spectrum. It would have been given in spectrum also. But I saw in Bipin Chandra, it is given. It was a direct question from Bipin Chandra. That's why I put it as an easy question. Let's move to question number six. Again, very, very easy question. Every standard book has given it. Bipin Chandra has written about it. Your spectrum has given it. What is this? INA trials, also known as Red Fort trials, when they were being done, Britishers thought that let us pick one Muslim, let us pick one Hindu, let us pick one Sikh. We will make examples out of them. We will do this whole trial where we will do that in Red Fort to show the Indians that they were there in charge at that moment also. Of course, we know it didn't happen like that. The fact of the matter is they all were the officers of the Indian National Army and they were being trialed at this point, at this point of time. Very, very easy question. See, these are the questions where you need to get your two marks. You need to earn your two marks. If you have missed out on these questions, this is slightly not good. Okay, let's move to the question number seven. Now, again, it I have put under the tough category, but then this is given in Bipin Chandra at different places. In chapter number two and chapter four of Bipin Chandra, this is given. For example, in chapter 2, when the rise of provincial kingdoms is being talked about, Bipin Chandra writes that this state emerged out of Hyderabad state. Of course, there Bipin Chandra does not write Arkat. There they have written Karnatic and they have talked about Karnatic. Though in chapter 4, when Anglo-Karnatic wars are being fought, in the second Anglo-Karnatic war, they write that Arkat was the capital of Karnatic. Bipin Chandra has clearly written that Karnatik was one of the six subas of the uh, Mughals and thus it came under the Hyderabad. So one was definitely correct. The moment one is correct, you can see the options have been formed in such a manner that only A could be correct. Even if you look at B or option number two, Mysore kingdom, see the Vudiyas, they were ruling. They had kept themselves away from Vijayanagar, nominally part of the Mughal Empire. And once the Vijayanagar had collapsed, they came to rule over this. Later, of course, Hyder Ali and his son Tipu Sultan from 1761 to 99, they ruled. And again, the Vudyars had come over here. It is a correct statement that this was a part of Vijayanagar kingdom, emerged out of this kingdom. Third is wrong. Again, Bipin Chandra has clearly given this in chapter 2 of its book. When the rise of provincial kingdoms, last paragraph is on Bangash Pathans, Rohillas. These Rohillas who were in Rohilkhand, they were the Afghans. But that did not. This empire was formed around the time of Farukshir. This was around the time of Muhammad Shah Rangila. Whereas as far as Ahmad Shah Abdali is concerned or Ahmad Shah Durrani is concerned, about them we study for the first time when they are attacking India in 1748. So this principality was formed way earlier. So three is wrong here. The answer will only be A. Moving to question number eight. In the first quarter of 17th century now, see again, I have put this question also tough. But then hint is given here. First quarter of 17th century, that means 
you only have to think about till 1625. They are asking in which of the following wars were the factory factories of the English East India Company located? Baroch, modern day Baruch, Chikakol, Shikakulam, and Trichurapalli. Now, again in Bipin Chandra, it is written that Jahangir was the Mughal ruler when the permission for these factories were sought. He allowed the factories to be created or formed in Surat, later gave permission for Agra, Broch, Masuli Patnam. So all these places he had given the permission. Only this is mentioned at this point of time. Chikakol, of course, later the English have got a factory over here, but this is not in the first quarter of the 17th century. So that means only one has to be the correct answer because anyways, once one is correct, C and D are wrong. So you don't have to think about three and then you only have to think about two. And as I said, two is wrong here, A will be the answer. Last question of modern history is question number ninth. You can see with reference to Madhunapalli of Andhra Pradesh, which one of the following statements is correct? Now, let me eliminate this for you. First of all, let me eliminate D option. Why? Because again in socio-religious reform movements, we have studied this, that these people, they came and they established the headquarters of Theosophical Society in Adyar, modern day Chennai, those days Madras. D is wrong. Then I will eliminate option B. Pattabhi Sitaramaya led the Quit India movement of Andhra region from here. Now, if you think, Pattabhi Sitaramaya, the great Congress leader, his name comes in post-independence in JVP committee and pre-independence because he lost the election in Tripuri at the hands of Subhash Chandra Bose. Around this time, Quit India movement, he was a member of CWC. And as you all have studied, Quit India movement was basically a leaderless movement. Almost all the prominent Congress leaders were put behind the bar on the morning of 8th August, the moment they decided that this is going to be launched. Next morning, everybody was arrested. So, this man was also arrested. So, how could he lead over here? So, I would eliminate this. Now, two options are left. Number one, Pingali Venkavya. Venkaya. Now, if you see this man, some of you, you have to understand here that this man was very much in news. Why was he in news? Because Andhra Pradesh government, they had demanded and there have been demands that this great man should be given Bharat Ratna for the fact that he developed the tricolor of us. Now, he is from Andhra Pradesh. Whether he is from this place or not, that is the big question. Now, some of you will say, why did this question come this time? Because there is question on Padam Shri's, there is question on this. I will tell you. This man was in news because exactly 100 years ago in April 1921 he had got this national flag done and handed it over to Mahatma Gandhi. So that's why it was in news and this has come but then the correct answer is not this the correct answer is C and that's why it is I have put it as a tough question. Because it's very tough for you all to remember that Ravindar Tagore would have translated his national anthem from Bengali to English at a place, at a small district, in a small district of Andhra Pradesh. Because you all know your Janaganaman was done way earlier, was composed in 1911 and in that year only in Congress session it was sung also. But this translation to English, the tuning and all that was done much later around this period of time in 1921. So, these were the nine questions. Of course, the answer to this question as you all saw will be C. This is more of a quiz type of question that do you know this? Again, if you would have read the news, if you have some idea about the national flag, of course, I don't expect that you should know where it would have been created. But then I will tell you, nine questions came from modern. Three you should have definitely done. Some of those who would have done more extensive research would have gone till three more. They would have gone to six. Of course, three of them were really tough. Four I have said to be tough, but three of them were really tough. If you have gone through Bipin Chandra, minimum five questions you could have attempted, got few of them correct also. So with this, let us wrap this session. It's all already been almost three and a half hours that we have been with you. 
I hope you enjoyed the lecture, you enjoyed this whole discussion that we did at this point of time. This whole prelims question papers analysis discussion, the expected cutoff, do tell how much you are getting and do post your comments. We'll be happy to oblige and answer it over there. That's all from this lecture. Thank you. My best wishes and the best wishes from the entire Baiju's IES faculties that most of you and you know as many of you clear the exam. Take care. Goodbye.